Good evening, everyone. Today is June 6, 2021. And this is a meeting of the Christian Board of Selectmen. I'll rise, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Gentlemen, do I have a motion to open the meeting tonight? Mr. Chairman, I just want to go correct the record. It's June 21st. It is June 21st. Very good. So moved to open the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, first thing we have today is uh, minutes that need to be approved by the Board of Selectmen. Um, motion to approve the minutes as presented. With just a correction on one, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, June 30th, 2020, on the new business, the first paragraph needs some correction. Um, I could work with Ms. Leonard on that correction. Very good. I have a second? Mr. Chairman, I wasn't here for the 25th. Uh, so. Uh, then I'll uh, second the uh, minutes for the 25th, February 25th, 2020 meeting. And all in favor of that? Aye. Aye. And uh, as Mr. Gaspar mentioned, uh, the Tuesday, June 30th, 2020 meeting and the executive session, November 16th, 2020, um, with the amendments to the first paragraph on the new business. Do I have a second for that? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Uh, we have meeting mail. The first letter we have is from a gentleman, uh, Richard Gavush, who has uh, expressed interest to be appointed to the Historical Commission. Uh, in his letter, Mr. Gavush mentions that he was on the Cushion Zoning Board of Appeals for four and a half years, and three, three of those years as chairman. He's a lifelong resident of Cushion. He feels he could contribute to the Historical Commission. Do I have a motion to accept his uh, appointment? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Next we have a letter from Charles Leonard, who has expressed interest in appointment to the Board of Appeals as an alternate. Uh, Mr. Leonard, as some people may know, is Mr. Cesspool here in town. Also has been on the bylaw review committee and has served on the DPW board <coughs> in the past. So I have a motion to accept his appointment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Chairman, while we're on the subject of the uh, Board of Appeals um, about getting the public leaders, let me just want to check the attendance of some of the members to ensure that we have a full, that you know, we've got a quorum and you know, people are participating. So maybe we can go back and take a look at the the attendance and if there are any gaps, uh, then maybe perhaps we need to address, address that with those folks and uh, look for a suitable replacement. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe later tonight we're going to do appointments. And uh, Ms. Hebert, you did send out letters to everybody who we're going to appoint tonight, and they yes. did come back with us except for a couple people. There are a few, but none from Board of Appeals. All the Board of Appeals members right. responded. The problem, the problem I, I think, Selectman one, I agree with Selectman Wong, that's something I took issue to early on, um, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, is if people are appointed to boards and committees and they're not <coughs> making the meeting, um, as Mr. Um, Wong has alluded to, I agree, if you can't make your attendance, then perhaps you're not fit for that committee or board, you know, or maybe just reasons outside of their um, purview that they can't make them, but um, that attendance is an absolute necessity when you are appointed to one, especially the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, where it demands a four or five vote. So I think Mr. Warner is spot on with That's correct. attendance, especially for Zoning Board of Appeals. We have had some problems over this past year, and I know the pandemic's been out there, but um, most of them were Zoom meetings. Um, and there's been some back and forth about missing meetings and holding up projects and the things of the like. So <coughs> I'd like to uh, look at attendance on zoning board of appeals at least. Well, we've had that, and we've also had it on um, Conservation Commission, mm -hmm. which has come up uh, over the last few months. So, uh, so very good. We'll review and... Uh, yep, I'll look at that. Thank you. Okay, third from meeting mail. Tonight we have a letter of resignation from Finance Committee member 
Ron Melbron in his letter. Says, Please use this letter to confirm my resignation from the Kushner Finance Committee effective immediately. Unfortunately, my business commitments, especially during the spring season, do not allow me to participate in the meetings as I feel is necessary. It has been a pleasure to serve and wish to express my gratitude to all of the committee members and especially to Julie Hebert for all of her dedicated work for our town. And uh, gentlemen, do I have a motion to accept the resignation of Finance Committee Member Ron Melbourne? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, let's see who we have here. We're going to go a little bit out of order tonight. And with us tonight, we have uh, gentleman Don Jacobs, who is here to talk about uh, the union wage and the classification update. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, uh, I believe you, uh, Julie has given you copies, <coughs> excuse me, of the uh, proposed plan for the AFSCME union. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just want to just make a couple of opening comments and then obviously uh, I'm here to answer any questions and or concerns you might have about the uh, study. Uh, in, in the report I always give right at the beginning a, uh, what I call the goal of the purpose, you know, why did we do the study? Why did the town want <coughs> to, to uh, take a look at how uh, positions in the AFSCME group are being paid and also obviously employees as well. And as it says in the goal statement, you know, the purpose of the study was to establish a process. And I think that's one of the things that I really want to emphasize for the board. The way we've gone about doing this study and the process now that has been established in doing this study um, was really intended to accomplish a couple of basic things. Um, it was to enable the town to pay positions and secondly pay employees. Uh, and the two key words that you see in the goal statement are to do it fairly and the word fairly in this case, in this context means consistent. And frankly, consistent means you can explain it. So how a position is paid, more money or less money, and or an employee, whatever aspect of compensation you want to look at, by doing this fairly, in effect, the town is establishing a process enabling you to do it consistently. The other um, primary purpose and reason for doing the study was to do, was to pay positions and employees equitably. Well, as you can see in the goal statement, the word equitable means competitive. And when we use the word competitive, again, we're talking about both positions and employees. What that really means is both competitively internally within this particular group, because it is a bargaining group, and so by definition, by state law, you've got to look at this as a standalone um, group. But it also means in comparison, obviously, to the marketplace. So my objective in doing these types of studies is to, based on how you're currently doing it, establish a process that frankly everyone understands. No one that has a vested interest, in other words, in how positions and or employees in this group, whether you're a member of the bargaining unit or selectman or finance committee or anyone, town administrator included, um, should understand and hopefully agree to the process. You can always agree to disagree about the results relative to how a position and or an employee is being paid, but no one, and I really repeat, no one should dis disagree with the process. If there is a concern about the process, then frankly it really should be discussed and whatever issues are addressed and frankly um, resolved one way or the other. But the bottom line is that it's absolutely essential in order to manage compensation effectively that everyone understand how it's being done. That's not the case today. When you look at your current plan, as I did when I looked at it for the first time, what you see is a compensation plan consisting of 10 grade levels and positions classified or assigned to those grade levels. And as you've, you've probably seen from looking at the plan, um, you have a minimum and a maximum salary range for each of those 10 grade levels. And within those grade levels or salary ranges, excuse me, uh, you have steps. In fact, there are five, well, depending upon what step you're in, there are basically five steps in the plan today. But the fundamental problem, you know, that Julie and I have talked a lot about is understanding, well, how has a position initially been assigned to one grade level and not another? You know, what was the process? Well, that process now has been outlined for you. And the way we've gone about developing the process uh, initially to address how to pay positions has been to develop really basically three steps. Three objectives have been accomplished. One, we've now written what I would describe to you as accurate job descriptions. Accurate means two things. 
It means accurately describing where an employee spends uh, the majority of his or her time, not necessarily every single thing they do, but it also means describing what are the minimum qualifications. And what we mean by minimum qualifications uh, is the minimum knowledge, ability, and or skill in accordance with the working conditions that those job duties are carried out um, to, to enable you to compare positions to one another and in doing so, as I've just said, write an accurate job description. Mm -hmm. The other objective, which the board may or may not be familiar with, and you, and you saw it mentioned in the report, is that in developing this process again, what we also have in mind is that the town needs to comply with what's referred to as the pay equity law, which is a law that was passed by the Commonwealth about three years ago now, pertain, actually pertaining to both public and private sector employers, not just the public sector. But what that law basically says is that essentially you can't just use market data in order to determine whether or not you're paying positions, again, quote unquote, equitably. What you have to do or what you have to use as criteria to determine whether you're paying positions equitably is what I just referred to as the minimum qualifications or the minimum knowledge, ability, and skill, all of which is now described in the job descriptions that have been written. And that enables the town to be able to, in this case, pay this particular bargaining group and comply with the pay equity law at the same time. Okay? So the three objectives, writing job descriptions, developing a grade or classification plan, and then lastly, a compensation plan. Those are the three things that were specifically have been accomplished or been done in doing this particular study. Okay? Um, and based on the job descriptions, again, uh, they've all been written consistently and describing accurately those minimum qualification or criteria relative to the knowledge, ability, and skill that each position requires. And in doing so, now we've recommended a classification plan, or you might call it a grade plan that instead of 10 grade levels, we're recommending three grade levels. And the point I want to make there is basically that your 10 grade levels, at least from my perspective, were more than likely developed based solely on dollars and cents, not based on what the employees, the minimum qualifications that they were required to have to carry out their job duties. So in other words, what basically has happened is that when we wrote those job descriptions, and I can come back and talk about the process to write them, but to write them accurately, enabling us to compare positions to one another, and again, comparing both the minimum knowledge, ability, skill, and um, responsibility that are required to carry out their respective job duties, we're now recommending a grade level structure that's consistent with those different levels of responsibility that exist within this particular um, group of positions. And again, we're only talking about this specific group, because again, as I said to begin with, uh, this is a bargaining group, and so by definition, that's really all we can look at. Um, so the three grade levels, there's nothing magic about the three grade levels. Believe me when I tell you, we had no idea what the grade level structure might look like until we had written initial job descriptions and, and then used the position rating system to compare positions to one another. And I know that's a mouthful what I just said, but basically the simplest way to understand this is to look at it from the perspective of writing a job description and in this case writing descriptions for all the positions. And once we did that, we then developed a classification plan or a grade level structure that's consistent with your organizational structure or that, the other way to say that it's consistent with the different levels of responsibility that exists within these positions. There's a chart in the report that's referred to as a characteristic chart that basically describes the characteristics or the criteria that we've used to define each of the three grade levels. Again, not based on dollars and cents but based on the minimum qualifications. So once we had developed a grade level plan, a classification plan, uh, then we collected market data, as you might expect. But we also, in order to define the word competitive, used two other criteria. And again, all this is spelled out in the report that you, you've gotten copies of. So the three criteria we used to define competitive were the market data, the rate of pay of the employee at the present time, and then thirdly, uh, the number of years that each employee has been in their current position. And by doing so, as you, I think you can begin to understand, we're not just using market data, which again, the pay equity law says you're not supposed to do anymore. So in applying those three criteria, we now have developed a compensation plan. And what I mean by compensation plan is a salary range structure with a minimum and a maximum for each of the three grade levels. And those minimum maximum numbers 
are tied directly to the survey average midpoint that we refer to as the benchmark for each of the respective grade levels. In other words, we collected market data, we grouped the market data by how we initially grouped or classified positions. We then went back and took the survey average midpoint for each of the respective grade levels, ruling out basically the highs and the lows of the market data that we collected because frankly the market data just isn't all that reliable. It's very, very misleading. So by focusing on the midpoint, we're trying to minimize that aspect of using market data to help us define the word competitive. And again, I know I've quickly run through that when I, what the process entails, but suffice it to say, um, in doing these types of studies, and, and, and I've been doing this now for 20 years, and I've probably done almost 200 of these kinds of studies, not just here in Massachusetts, but frankly up and down the East Coast, um, one of my biggest concerns when I start a study like this is two real basic concerns. One is the need to establish open lines of communication, which really addresses the need for everyone to understand the process. And then secondly, to be able to establish a process enabling the town to maintain the compensation plan that's now being recommended to you. So establishing a process once again, not only to develop this particular plan, three grade levels and respective salary ranges, um, then again, meet the standard of being competitive both internally and externally. And along with that, a process to enable the town to maintain the plan, frankly, and to do it within the town. I Meaning you don't really need to bring someone like myself or any other outsider, frankly, in my opinion. This process is designed to be simple enough, frankly, so everyone should understand it. I mean, I can't put it to you any other way, no matter who you might be, okay? And if you look at it from another perspective, particularly from the Board of Selectmen's point of view or the Finance Committee's point of view, this process is enabling you, enabling you to develop a compensation plan and then, as part of your budget process, frankly, decide how much you can afford to spend. So the affordability, the cost, aspect of developing a compensation plan is really separate from this particular study or this plan. In other words, the plan by itself doesn't really cost you any money, per se. Writing job descriptions, developing grade levels, and respective salary ranges, that's the basic plan and that buying in itself, you know and I know, it doesn't cost money until you spend money to hire someone and or to retain them. And at that point we're talking about the employee, obviously, both to hire someone as well as to retain them, okay? Um, and so that basically is, is the plan. Um, again, I think it's important uh, for you as well as everyone else that has a vested interest in not only this group of positions, but frankly, at some point, all the positions in the town, in other words, the process really should be the same. I heard you mention earlier in your conversation about different processes to pay different people. Um, you could pay people different amounts of money but the process should be the same. And by doing that, you're making a commitment or, or essentially making a statement as to the value as to how you want to treat both positions as well as employees. And the bottom line, as we all understand it, is based on what you can afford. So the affordability aspect of compensation is always there. All we've done is develop a process to bring you to that point where then you're ready to decide, one, how much money you can afford to spend, and then last but not least, uh, develop the best way possible to spend the money, okay? Um, and so that's the recommended plan, and I'm happy to maybe stop at that point and obviously answer any questions and or concerns that you might have. Gentlemen, any questions? Yeah, so less questions, but more um, just an observation. I just think, you know, whether it's a municipality, whatever organization, if you can create a process and a system that ensures the stability, I think that that's like the key to success. You know, if there's force, if there's you know volatility and turnover, um, I think that's when you lose out on opportunities, and that's when the organization starts to uh, go through some upheaval, which I don't think is good. You know, especially as right. a municipality, the more stable things are, the better we can you know perform for the for the taxpayers. So I think this will hopefully help at least give us a guideline mm -hmm. to to achieve some degree of stability. Uh, within town government, if you look at some of the higher um, performing departments, you, know, you, get, you know, three people here today, the fire chief, building inspector, and our DPW, we've had stability in those departments for quite some time, right? And we're able to move things quickly. Um, we see, you know, the departure of Allen, town administrator, 
had to make, you know, change was, had, change was made, Julie came on board. There's a degree of, you know, onboarding that takes place and, mm -hmm. you know, there'll be some time before everybody starts to feel that continuity. So hopefully this will help us uh, get to that, uh, mm -hmm. get to that point or achieve that uh, for overall town government. Yeah, if I could just make one quick comment, you know, as a follow-up to what you just mentioned. Um, I mean, if there's one characteristic that really describes every single plan study I've ever done, and as I said, I've probably done almost literally 200 of these kinds of studies over the last 20 years, uh, the number one issue, make no mistake about it, uh, is communication, not the money. In other words, how these decisions are made, which are inherently subjective, someone has to decide how to pay a position just as someone has to decide how to pay an employee. Uh, that process, and again, if you look at the final report, what I've recommended in the report is that that process, which I've now spelled out for you, the, pro the steps we went through in writing job descriptions, surveying the marketplace, and developing, and, and really basically doing everything in the study, I've now given to you in writing. Um, you know, this is my one opportunity really to say to you as a board, if you're comfortable with the plan and you understand the process and you feel it's in the town's best interest as well as the employee's best interest, so it's a true win-win in the true sense of the phrase, um, then what I, I want to really strongly encourage the board to do is to adopt that process, put it in writing, and include it in your other personnel policies and procedures so that everyone understands how the town of Kushnet pays positions and pays employees. Whether they're in a bargaining group and or not in a bargaining group, doesn't make any difference. The only difference or distinction relative to a bargaining group versus a non-bargaining group or a non-union group is the process the town has to follow in order to make a change. That's it. But frankly, a position is a position. Whether it's in the fire department or the police department, it makes no difference. Other than what's unique to that particular position as it relates back to the minimum qualifications that I mentioned earlier. They obviously vary, they differ in that regard, but the process is the same. So again, I want to just reiterate, communication is the number one issue, and the best way that I've ever seen in order to deal with the communication issue is to put the process in writing. Because turnover is a given. It's just a question of when turnover occurs, as the chairman mentioned earlier. It's, it's about, it has to happen at some point in time. Having this compensation process put in writing will help the town deal with the communication aspect, which doesn't really cost you any money. Uh, but I can't stress enough to the board how critically important that is. That's the most important thing you can do, in my opinion, is approve the process and by in doing so put it in writing. So I don't mean to belabor that point, but any more than I already have. But I, again, I can't tell you, when you look at how municipalities manage compensation, that's the key distinction. All you have to do is ask another municipality, have you put the process in writing? Talk to an employee. Ask them if they understand how they're being treated. Right now, the answer here is no. They know the numbers, but what they don't understand, because you haven't communicated to them, is how the process works. And it should be a process that, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is a true win-win. Everybody should understand and everybody should feel they're benefiting by it. It doesn't mean I don't want to be paid more money, so don't, don't misunderstand me. Or it doesn't mean that the town can't afford to spend more money, as the case might be but at least everyone agrees and understands the process. That's why this you know, bargaining group puts the process in writing. But interestingly enough, when you look at your contract, there's nothing in this document that tells you how it's done. It's just a bunch of numbers, which means you're leaving it up to someone to be able to interpret it or understand it. And you and I both, we all understand, depending upon who you might be, you're bound to have a different interpretation or a different opinion. And that's not to anyone's best interest to have it like that. So the last thing, oh, I forgot to mention, and I'm sorry, I just remembered. On a positive note, frankly, uh, the up upshot of this whole study, as I mentioned, determining whether people are paid competitively, I gotta tell you, you know, the almost 200 studies I've ever done, this is one of the first ones that I can think of where all the employees, in my opinion, based on the process that we followed, are in fact being paid competitively. I, it's, it's never happened. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't seem, it, it just, I can just tell you a fact, it just doesn't happen. And so when I looked at the results, once we gathered the market data and we looked at the rate of pay of the employee in their years of service, and there's a chart in this report that shows you that. It shows you where all the employees are today based on their current rate of pay in years of service within this proposed plan. And basically they're all within the second and third quadrants. They're all right in the middle of the proposed ranges. 
And lastly, before I forget again, uh, you'll notice that the ranges are pretty wide, the minimum and the maximum. The reason for that is that you're dealing with a, a employee collective bargaining group that has a multi-year agreement. And so the range structure that's been developed is wide enough from the minimum to the maximum, the differential, so that the town doesn't have to change the ranges every year during the course of the contract. In other words, let the marketplace catch up to you. The minimum and the maximum numbers don't cost you any money. Again, you don't necessarily pay someone a minimum and or a maximum. How they grow within the range, the board really needs to determine, right, within that set of guidelines, I guess you could say, okay? And that is different, frankly, than the way you've been managing compensation in the past. But again, it gives you the flexibility, frankly, to be able to decide, again, based on what you can afford, the best way to spend the money. Yes, Scott, any uh, comments? <clears throat> no, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'd just like to thank Mr. Jacobs for his um, work and dedication to the town um, when it comes to the wage classification. And I'm not just saying, you know, about adopting it and not adopting it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information here. Mm -hmm. um, and to say I got through this through the weekend with Father's <laughs> Day being Sunday would be a lie. So um, I'm looking forward to getting through that document. Um, there's a lot of paper there. Mm -hmm. um, so I look forward to getting through the waging class and hopefully um, deriving a sheet of questions and be able to speak with you in the future on it. But, Absolutely. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of information in there and mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of it I could get through relatively quickly because I'm familiar with them, but mm -hmm. um, how you got to some of your information seems very interesting relative to the last waging classification that we had done. Mm -hmm. So I really do mm -hmm. look forward to looking at your research um, and how you've derived to certain numbers and positions and, you know, at the end result, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing um, coming, sure. from, coming from you. Yeah, it'll be my pleasure. And any questions the board has, you know, Julie knows how to get in touch with me. Mr. Jacobs, I concur with Mr. Gaspar's comments. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to digest this, mm -hmm. but I would also like to ask the board that, you know, we take the time and look at it and, um, and come up with an answer, you know, whether to adopt or change or adapt or, or how we want to go forward from here. Uh, we do have the Ask Me contract uh, mm -hmm. negotiation coming up again uh, next year. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to have a plan and a direction as we enter those negotiations, I think sure. it will be very helpful. Absolutely. So, uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. For the effort. And, and, and again, uh, if you have any questions, obviously I'm happy to help explain and get you to a point where you feel comfortable understanding what, what this is intended to do. Well, certainly. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, President V. I look forward to uh, getting through this one um, and having some dialogue with the board as well as the town administrator because we do have other um, mm -hmm. unions to negotiate with. And you hear a lot of, well, this is being paid and that's being paid and this is being paid. And then I find myself almost doing a job like you have where you're researching other communities, trying to see what people are doing and understanding what the job duties are in another town and somebody could say hey that person's getting paid 50 grand I'm only getting paid 40 grand but that person's job description is clearly outweighing this one so why am I paying you the same 50 if you're not doing merely the amount of work that that position is doing and that's where somebody like myself or anyone that is on a board of selectmen can really get really caught up in a lot of unnecessary time research and things and that's pretty much what your job was here um, and that's why yeah. I appreciate your time and your professionalism doing something like sure. this. It saves me, I hope, um, that I don't see a lot of discrepancies from what I've already learned in the process of doing this stuff versus what you've done. And I, I, I don't think that will be the case based on everything you presented to the board. You know, and I think if, if, you, if you look at the current plan, so let me just use one example, you know, without getting into a lot of detail, but basically right now you're paying library positions in this group at three different pay levels. And the end result is that there aren't three levels of responsibility. When you look at what the individuals are actually doing, and it isn't the amount of work they do, it's the, again, as I said earlier, it's the minimum skill, effort, and responsibility, or what they need to know in order to carry out their job duties. And when you compare them to one another, there aren't three levels of responsibility, even within the library. Your dispatcher positions that are in this study, very similar type of situation. When you look at how Currently, your dispatcher positions are being paid in relationship to the other positions within the group. Again, that's the way we went about then de determining that there really, when it was all said and done, very simply three levels of responsibility, not ten. 
So instead of 10 pay levels, we're saying there really should only be three, but the number of pay levels is not determined by dollars and cents. It's determined by, again, writing the job descriptions consistently and then comparing them to one another to basically describe, the, again, the, the skill, effort, and responsibility that is required of, of the employee in a particular position. Then we looked at the dollars and cents, but not until we first had developed a grade plan and we said that, you know, it was sent back to department heads, um, you know, they were part of this uh, particular group or this study um, to get their input into the process as well relative to how they're managing their respective departments. So I had, you know, lengthy conversation with your police chief, for example, about the dispatch positions and how those positions are currently being managed by the police chief. And the same kind of conversation with your library director. How are you managing these positions today as they compare to one another and how does the job descriptions I've provided to you compare to that method, that process that you're using right now in managing the library. So suffice it to say that um, your department heads, particularly as it relates to these particular positions, have had a good deal of input with regard to how they're managing the positions and so that then when it's all said and done, they'll know that their management process and how they're organized within the respective departments is consistent with how the positions are being paid. And right now, that's not the case. And as I said to Julie uh, several times, the most significant change here is not the money. As you think and already see when you say you know, you're going from 10 grade levels to 3 grade levels, that's a significant change. Right? Something's Depends different. Depends on where that range is in the 3 and the 10, right? Well, yeah. How'd you get from 10 to 3? Why is it at 4? Why is it at 2? The answer to that question is very simply. Just look at the characteristic chart that describes what we mean by each of the grade levels. If I were to ask you today, well, what do you mean by grade level two versus five or 10 or eight? Other than the dollars and cents, I think you'd have a hard time explaining it, let alone understanding it, okay? That should never happen again. And, and again, if you're comfortable with this process that we followed in developing this particular plan, the same process would apply to all the other positions, okay? Not a different product, it would be exactly the same. The results would be different. <laughs> depending upon the positions, obviously. And, and believe me, when you're an employee, that's a nice thing they want. Employees typically want to hear that you understand what it takes for me to do what I am required to do. You understand the pressure that I work with, the, the skill that I need to have to do what I do. That's the message that I'm really trying to encourage the board to send to your employees. It's not about the money. It's about understanding what we require you to do and what, what skill and or ability you need to have to do it. And we're going to pay you as a result of that. Okay, that's the link, that's the tie-in. Um, the money, obviously, to a large extent, is affected by what you can afford to spend. And, and most people understand that. Whether they like it or not is a whole other story. But as I said earlier, you know, the question I really try to encourage people to ask is, well, what's the best way to spend that money? And that question oftentimes really doesn't get discussed or asked as much as I think it should, because the money is limited. You know, your revenues are what they are. And you don't have unlimited amounts of money to generate, uh, to pay for anything, really, other than what you feel are the most important aspects of managing the town. Uh, this just is one of them. So, well, very good. again, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Sorry yeah. to run on. That's not a problem. Thank, thank you very much for your time today. I look forward to talking to you again. Mr. Jacobs, your cell phone number on this, on this presentation is oh, accurate. Yeah. Julie doesn't know how to get me. Or so she does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's there. Yeah. Or if they don't get me, I'll get them. <laughs> As they will. So feel free to reply anytime. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next in our appointments, we have uh, Mr. Merritt. You're up. Uh, how are you today? I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Um, you have a few things you want to talk to us about. Uh, one is the, uh, the telephone poles or the installation of solar farms and telephone poles to get uh, on the ground utilities in well, a way. What I'm, or what I'm trying to do, Mr. Chairman, is to encourage um, solar developers right now to look more in line with what Kearsarge did on Middle Road, which is to bring their power from their units underground out to the street. Um, Eversource seems to be making an effort that we want everything up above ground. I've tried to explain to the planning board that's not necessarily the case. The case is they want to get the power out to the street. It doesn't have to go overhead. 
and you can see from some of the documents that I provided you, mm -hmm. like the new project that they're proposing out on Robinson Road, there's 12 telephone poles that stick there. So it doesn't really matter how much we try to protect the visual aspect of the community by putting up burns or making plantings or creating fencing, you can't disguise 12 telephone poles sticking out above the field. Um, people drive in from, from Rochester, it's gonna be one of the first things that they see. Um, on Main Street, there's another one right between two homes where there's six telephone poles right along, one right inside the other. There's just no reason why those poles can't go underground. So my actual thought is, and maybe I haven't proposed enough of a fee, but my thought is, is to charge these people $5,000 per pole, which may encourage them to then take the power and put it underground, put it into a concrete vault where they have the control panels um, in these green boxes um, mm -hmm. that uh, you know are easy. It, everything's red, like the one for Curisage. The entire field is documented right on the face of, of the control panel. Um, so they know exactly how many how many panels are there, how many, or when I say panels, I mean how many solar panels are in the field, where they're located, how they're located, how they're switched. Um, and, and I think that's really what we want to do. I mean, we're being inundated with these things, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I'd rather have these than residential developments. I, I mean, I think that has a tremendous impact on the community in a negative way. Um, I think the solar fields actually provide a good income source for a long period of time, um, but I think we want to encourage them to do it the way we want them to do it. Otherwise, you know, there's even been talk now about maybe putting a moratorium on them. I don't necessarily think we have to go that route, um, but I think this is an alternative which we can encourage them to develop the panel or develop the fields the way we want to see them develop. Um, mm -hmm. Is this $5,000 fee comparable? To underground utilities, I mean, is it something that that I don't know? It's I mean, high enough. I mean, they might just still say, "Hey, it's still less expensive to put the poles in and and go that direction," or you know, is there any? I mean, my my actual hope is: is there cost for putting the poles in? If you look at the poles, like if we look at Robinson Road, there's 12 poles. That's sixty thousand dollars plus the cost that they're paying to put the poles in. My my honest feeling is: is that they can do this underground much more cheaply than that and eliminate that fee. But do I have, you know, particular right. data to back that up? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. do, I other, know. do other towns, have other towns that have you researched other towns on I how they're addressing this? Because we're not the only ones that are seeing this. And I agree with you, Mr. Merritt, that we are seeing, I, I would say, an overabundance mm -hmm. of solar development in our community, and it's affecting wildlife and pushing it into residential areas. And I've gotten a lot of complaints about that wildlife issue. Um, and, and maybe a moratorium is something that we may need to look at to slow this down and give us a little break from that kind of development and allow wildlife. When you have multiple projects going and you're wiping out 20, 30, 50 acres of property in multiple areas of the town, that's not good for wildlife. That becomes a problem. Um, approximately how many, or exactly how many do we have on the books right now? I know we have three operating. We have three operating. We have 12 that have been approved by the planning board ready, ready for you know, installation. Now, there's two sides to this. Some of the property or some of the proponents for solar have actually put the proposals back before the town looking for their approval, and then they go to Eversource looking for their interconnectivity agreement. There are others who go to Eversource getting their interconnectivity agreement, like Kearsarge did, so that once the board approved, they went right ahead and began to do the installation. That's correct, because um, that can be a period of time, right? I mean, the, the driving range over here on Main Street, that's been approved by the town for a period of time. That's been approved, and, and the, the applicants or the co contractors have actually you know, said, listen, we're ready to get going, but even with that, that was probably two months ago that they, they called me up and said, you know, this is what we're ready to do. Mm -hmm. um, the most recent one, I think, is 550 Main Street that they'll, they'll start with, but the same contract or same proponent is doing both projects. Right, but the Eversource connection is, can take some time. We yeah, can prove it, and then they, it can take... They originally put their petition before the planning board two years ago. Two years ago, okay. Jim, do you, do you know, uh, are you working with the planning board as far as being the zoning enforcement officer to make sure that they're, they're complying with the bylaws when they're approving these projects because i know inside the bylaws 
for anything above, I forget the exact size, maybe it's a one megawatt for solar field. It, there's, there's, there's a bylaw that states, like the site plan approved that they have to go through for tree cutting, anything more than a six inch trunk, things of the like. Yeah, they are, they, are they going through that process and making sure they're complying with the bylaws when it comes to these massive, but some of these that I've seen, they're quite large facilities um, and a lot of them need tree clearing. Um, and we have a bylaw that says, you know, that needs to be reviewed. And I'm, are yeah, we there, really doing that? There are, yes, there are three of them on the books right now um, where there is considerable amount of clarity. Um, one of the things that we took a look at was having um, Mr. Hannon be involved with looking for stormwater and looking at the, the criteria that ha the bylaws have established. So he's been on top of that. Um, and he's in contact with me to let me know that that's what they're looking at and what the fees they're charging actually for those those impacts. Um, you know, it's by law of the state we can't actually deny a solar from coming in, but we can regulate them to a point where they're going to provide the, the protections that we sure. want to see. Um, sure. Two of the larger ones that we have right now, of course, they're so remote they won't be seen by anybody. Similar to the very first one we put in the community. And you know that's that's kind of what we would hope to have, right. um, and of course the end result is is that by them developing these parcels of land um, in in solar, they're also you know one of them particularly actually overlays a project when I first came into town that was like 330 houses, um, you know that that could have been really catastrophic to the community. So the impact of solar really is is non-existent relative to you know how much tree clearing may go on, but. Yeah, I think we're looking as, as consistently and as pessimistically as we can at how the impacts that these fields have on our community. Mm. And you know, you can't deny that they, they have some impact on the biodiversity of the community, but um, you know, there are other developments, particularly residential developments, which could have a similar or more impactful. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I'm not. Well, listen, we, we, we were all for it. Um, green energy community back in 2012 or 13, whatever it is, right? Um, I'm all for green energy, but, you know, when it starts consuming all your land um, in, a, in a municipality, I think Rochester is facing the same kind of, I call it kind of a crisis, um, and that's really what it's become. Yeah, we are basically agricultural and, communities. And, so and not all land is developable to residential property as it would be for a solar farm. So, right. you know, you got there's, there's pros and cons on everything, but you when we say this, it could be potentially 50 acres developed to residential, that's not necessarily always a true statement because it's not always perkable, right, and buildable, Correct. first of all. Um, and wetlands has a lot to do with it and things of the like. So, I mean, you know, you might look at 50 acres and say, oh, that's 25, 30 house lots, um, but it's really not once you're all done with the wetlands and, and things of the like and right. perks and tests and Title Fives and all that stuff. You did. But the same restrictions apply to solar as well. You know, I mean, you can't build solar fields in wetlands. So, I mean, they, they do have that same Yeah, as far as that goes. Well, you don't have to perk test for a solar field, right? This is right. Okay. Mr. Lana. Just, Jim, I... I think it's a great idea with the fees, but I guess the question is, can we just require underground? I mean, do you have to go, I mean, what would prevent us from saying? I think we can. I think from this point forward, we can. The issue I guess I have is that the planning board has approved all of the projects that have come before them now. Mm -hmm. The only recourse, my, my way of thinking is the only recourse we have to force them to put it underground, and it may not work that way, but I think the fee established may force them to look at putting the poles up in sequence the way they have and say, you know what, we're not going to pay that kind of money, so we'll go underground. That's that's my only So thought. this is, you're, you're saying that this policy would be not applied retroactively, but... Well, none of the projects have come to me for permitting yet. So gotcha. if the board approves the fee structure, then I have the right to apply it as the permit comes in. Um, those projects that have come into me for permitting, I can't apply. That. So what but, do we have to do then to require people to go underground? I think it would simply be talking to the planner when he comes on board and having them encourage the board. So the planning board would have to adopt that policy, is that what you're saying? Or I think they have the right to. I think that right, right. now they can, through, through um, site plan review and the special permit that they issue, um, they can say, listen, we don't want 
things yeah. underground. I mean, we don't we don't want um, right. the poles overhead. But that still doesn't underground. etch it in stone. We've learned that, right? Right. So I mean, it, it, I won't even go there. Yeah, I, I kind of like the high permit right. um, fee structure. Um, and yeah. put it in place, and then you kind of it kind of dictates to them if listen, if you're going to come in and wipe out 50 or 75 acres of freaking tree forestry, and to, to gain um, revenues for your company, the least you can do is put the poles, put the wiring underground, as Mr. Merritt's alluding to, and not make it look like a high tension lines from other source running through people's property. Right? I'm not disagreeing with that. I think this is a great this is a great idea. I'm just saying on the front end, before you get to the point where you have to have a conversation about putting poles up. That on the front end, make that the policy. So, I, I agree. I agree. So, however, we can make that happen, right? Is what we right. should do. So it's other, yeah. And I think that's the direction level. we will go in. Right. I, I also see, Mr. Barrett, you have five thousand dollars per battery storage. Well, one of the things we're finding now is battery storage is a big part of all the solar projects that are coming in because it allows a, a lot of flexibility for the solar developers mm -hmm. because what they're generating. If it doesn't go into the grid and isn't used, it's dumped. Now they can use the, the solar generation that they're getting by charging the batteries and feed back to the system the need as, as it comes about. The units that, that come in are highly valued. Um, they're like a million, million dollars per unit. Um, some of them are four to six units coming in. Um, so with that kind of value, um, and there is you know, certain um, criteria and certain inspections that need to be followed. Um, through the fire department as, as well as um, my electrical inspector that uh, I, I think it's warranted. I think if they, if they have this kind of money and put this kind of effort and um, value into the property, I think we have the ability to, uh, to put the fees there. And that's five thousand dollars per megawatt. So if we, yes. what are we getting now? Are we well, getting like five megawatt farms coming in? Is that um, what? Well, what I have ones? found is normally each container um, is usually a megawatt. So whether they come in as as two containers or four containers or six containers, you know, we would. Right. It seems like it's based on the megawatts of the Correct. farm and not the actual unit. Um, like if you get six units, it's not five thousand per unit. Correct. You know, right now, you're right. right now. Yeah. Right. So it'd be based. Uh, well, it is. If it's if it's one megawatt per battery storage unit. Oh yeah. Right. So then and picture a small camper sitting on a lot because that's how big some of these things are. They can actually be quite larger than that. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Marin's going with the one megawatt. Actually, it should be scaled um, in the permitting fees. And if it's one megawatt and they drop something half the size of this room, but as long as this room on the ground, it's 5,000 bucks. You drop another one side by side to piggyback that because they need two megawatts of storage, it's 10,000 bucks. Right. right, Mr. Marin? That's the way you're envisioning Correct. this. Correct. It's per megawatt unit. Right. So if they bring in one unit that's the size of this building and it's 20 megawatts, I'm not saying it's gonna happen, mm -hmm. You miss the marathon, right. that's a hundred thousand bucks because it's 20 megawatts, right? Right, so is with, with the planning board, is, is the planning board? I don't know if you guys are that far yet, but is the planning board considering um, incorporating the battery storage units as well in the decommissioning policy as part of that decommissioning policy? Because I know we're a little behind the curve with decommissioning policies, and I'll be talking to the town administrator and the board about that, um, upgrading our de decommissioning policy as far as fees. Yeah, um, how the board, well, the, the way the board used to look at decommissioning fees, it actually go to their independent um, consultant and have during peer review <coughs> determine what the value would be to decommission the site. Um, so if the site has battery storage, I know all of that is going um, to, to their, you know, under their, or being under. So they look at the plans that the planning board looks at, you look at. Correct. An engineer. No, I mean, and then the other issue, of course, is that the developers are also issuing this is what we feel is, is what the decommissioning costs are, of course. which end up being ridiculously low. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah, I've just been low. doing a lot of reading on it, and I, wasn't, I didn't realize how much I missed um, and how much we may be missing when it comes to the cost of decommissioning. So right. it's something that I'm reviewing now and reviewing how we do it and seeing if we actually have an adequate policy in place is for it, decommissioning. So is my um, assumption right that it's like $80,000 right now for yeah. decommissioning? It's right around that uh, averages, yeah. Again, it depends on the size of the system. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. One, one last I mean, we have anywhere between fifty-five and one hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars worth of decommissioning costs on the units that we have. Uh, Depending on the size yeah. of the farm. Right. Very good. Very good. Mr. Lawrence, what, what you you talked about a moratorium? I heard that reference tonight, and I'm that has come up in conversation. Is um, that allowed? 
would we be allowed to? I think it would have to go to a town meeting vote, and I believe that the legislature would, you know, maybe take a negative look upon that. I see. Okay, because it's, it's essentially it's by by right, right? Sole offense. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. if if we think a moratorium is not doable and is not achievable, what a cap? You know, if you were to say no more than two per calendar year or something like that. But if they, you're saying that that's not, you know, doable, then uh, I think the the way to approach it would be to encourage the planning board to understand the rights that they have mm -hmm. in site plan review and a special permit approval. Right. Um, and I think we have the ability to, to regulate the heck out of them to make sure that they're producing what we want to see in the community, not what they want to see in the community. Yeah, the stormwater is one of the major ones that we've missed for a long time. Yep. As far as stormwater permits go, right? right. We have a stormwater bylaw we have since 2007, um, and we have an issue of stormwater permit. So. Um, shame on those that are responsible for that, but, but the past is the past, and we'll figure this out. We're going to move forward um, into the future with this, but I think that's one of the biggest issues is stormwater fees as well. So do we need a motion to approve? Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I, so, uh, right. I make a motion to approve the, um, the permit. Second. Fees as presented by Mr. Merritt. Yep, at five thousand dollars per pole and five thousand dollars per megawatt of battery storage. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Merritt. Well, before you uh, uh, move on, I'm just going to go out of order here so I can let you go. You do have on the new business. You have a CARES request uh, for transfer of money for a printer scanner. On the agenda it's, here? It's, yeah, it's part of it. It's something that we've had discussion about, um, mostly for the use of those of us that need large plans. Um, right now, because of the software package that we have, we're actually getting um, you know, plans that I can actually visit on my um, computer screen, or on my monitor screen, right. which sometimes are almost not readable. Um, you have the ability to enlarge it on the screen, but then you're kind of scanning back and forth and back and forth to get it out. Correct. Um, it would be handy to have something that can come in where we can actually, I mean, I, ca I can demand each contractor to give me at least one set in that size, um, but in instances where we have a lot of people who come in who even want to say, you know, I'd like these reproduced or whatever, we, we can do that. Nice. Um, but the, the planner scanner um, would allow us also to take some of the plans that we have to scan them in and take them and file them electronically uh, because the new system or the filing system that I have is a great filing system. When we moved up to parting ways, we added a new carriage um, and in the few short years that I've been here because we've been so inundated with different plans that you know that new carriage is almost full mm -hmm. and we're packing files in there. So having the program, the software program they were using and having the ability, you know, all the plans done electronically and having to file them electronically will save that. But in instances where we do need to have paper um, plans, they can come in and we can file them, and we can print them, and we can reverse right. existing plans electronically. Right, well. so I could send you an electronic file of a plan and you could print it out, or, or vice versa. Or vice versa, scan correct. them, and, and that's what the machine would let really you do. Um, you would charge, you would charge, if somebody asked for a a larger scale. We, we do now. We charge for copies, right? So you yes. would charge, obviously, an appropriate fee for the larger copy and the ink associated with things of the like. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this money can be brought out from the CARES Act money? It can, yep. So um, this is in conjunction with the online permitting software, essentially encouraging social distancing, doing stuff online. Um, so yeah, it can be covered by CARES. And, and we said up to 10,000. We're trying to get a few quotes. The first one we had was around 8,500. So. I think for the printer, for the printer yeah, scanner for Mr. Mark. Printer scanner, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, money well spent, I think. Yep. Yeah. Well, it would also be something that all of our departments would share. Right. You know, D D DPW, Board of Health, ConCon, Planning. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, they all have the ability to use it. Very good. Kind of hard to look at an eight by eleven sheet of paper. <laughs> Such I've seen I've things. seen some of them before from you know where, but and you can't depict oh, anything off the plan, right? Right. So right. and it is nice cool. to have them and. For planning and things, Jim, we uh, ZBA. I think they have the right to ask for so many copies from the developer, yes, right? Yeah. But as far as what you're doing and you're talking about, just to have your ability to be able to hit the button and print one out and not 
wait for a developer to come in, right? Right. Okay, I'm so all gentlemen. for it. Okay, very good. So I have a motion, motion. to appropriate up to ten thousand dollars for the CARES. I mean, for the from the CARES Act for printer scanner. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Jim, Jim's helpful for the library part too, the outdoor performance area. Okay. Just, <laughs> just a little brief that, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> and then Jim's I like I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, that's well. I, I mean, I've yeah. spoken with, with the library director and, and with Julie as well as far as okay. what we can produce. Um, I know even um, Mr. Wall and I, we've talked briefly about, you know, certain pavilions that we would look at, you know, even at um, Riverfront Park and at Lakefront Park. You know, for the use of, of residents that we have here, I know there was, um, I think it was a FEMA grant um, that came in and, and they said basically we're offering this much money for these types of things. Um, and I think one of the encouraging things that they were looking at is that if we could produce some things that we wanted to, to see under $20,000, um, they, they would think more favorably upon that for us. Um, when I, at the time, I wasn't thinking about the library, but um, last week I sat down with, with Dina and looked what her criteria would be. There's a nice spot in what would be the south um, east corner of, of the lawn. Um, she wants to be able to have you know somebody who could have a small stage, do a performance, and seat 40 people underneath um, a roof. Mm -hmm. um, so we took a look at that, and you know I don't have a lot of the final details yet, but I'm pretty sure that you know. Doing it in-house, we could build that for under $20,000. Something like what we did down at the Council on Asia, maybe bigger though. But bigger, yes. Very good then. And uh, it would depend on, I mean, I know I haven't spoken specifically with Mr. Menard. Right. But he's so helpful in some areas. I mean, I know we could get him to remove the grass and, and dig the footings for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then we could do the rest of the building from that. Sure. So it's $25,000? Yeah, we can go, yeah. Can we go up to twenty five thousand? Depending on like the price. I don't know. Of the lumber one. might be a hundred dollars <laughs> or two by four. Lumber is very expensive. It's up to three hundred percent. Get that right. So, so a motion to approve uh, up to twenty five thousand dollars for the construction of an outdoor performance uh, facility at the library. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And once you figure that one out, Jim will maybe use that as a template for Lake Street in the Riverview. All right, that'd be great. Then. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Jim. Thank you. Okay, next we have all business. Uh, fire chief contract approval. Uh, gentlemen, uh, at the last meeting. Gentlemen, at the last yeah, meeting. we just went out. Of, I'm sorry, Mr. Chim. We just went out of order. So yeah. I'll just get myself yep. back off. Sorry. Find my good. stuff. Right, I'm good. Um, we met in executive session and uh, presented a. Uh, contract to the fire chief that um, he, we have come to an agreement with. So um, I don't know if we need to get into details. We talked about it. Motion to approve. Second, a bit of sweet, but uh, yes. Yep, and it is contingent upon your retirement in two years. I just wanted to bring that up a little. We had a little news out there. Uh, mm -hmm. But all in favor? Aye. 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 Chief, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, new business, uh, FY22 appointments. Uh, gentlemen, we have in front of us. You want it, you, Mr. Chairman, I, you want to go out of order and continue the fire sure. chief so he doesn't have to sit here, he's yep. got an RFP here. <laughs> for well, that is time. true, I, so right over there. if we could. Um, number seven, I can That's number that. seven, sir. Thank yes. you, gentlemen, let me uh, just get to uh, that in my book. Do we have any of that? Yeah, it's on the. Uh, yeah. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and if I could be retroactive for a minute, I want to thank you for uh, uh, the consideration and respect that was shown to me during the contract negotiations. It, it's, it's never been uh, cantankerous and never been done with any animosity. And I appreciate that a, a great, great deal. You're very welcome, Chief. So, gentlemen, uh, in preparation for my departure, uh, we had started a conversation during the last contract negotiation it was led by Selectman Gasper with the union to create a full-time captain's position, uh, which we currently do not have. Uh, this person would be uh, a truly identified second-in-command, 
which we have never had, uh, and would be working, uh, would be assigned to the daytime hours uh, for pretty much the purpose of me mentoring that person and bringing them along on the administrative uh, and inspectional aspects of the job of the fire chief. Uh, that's not to say that if we go ahead and create this position that the fire captain would necessarily be your choice of the next fire chief, uh, but what it would allow is uh, continuity for the, the time that uh, I would leave until such time as the board makes a decision uh, in what direction they want to go. So we don't drop the ball. I, mm -hmm. I don't want to have worked this hard and this long to, to see us backslide at all. So. Uh, to get that process moving, um, I present to you a, a draft RFP for an assessment center. Uh, this should look very familiar to you. Uh, it is uh, a draft document that was put together by um, the selectman and the police chief for the assessment center for police chief. Uh, and we modified it when necessary. Didn't need to make any improvements. It was a very good document to, to work with. Uh, but this would get the ball rolling um, soon. You know, in the, hopefully you gentlemen will be supportive of this and if I could just make the personal request that we get moving on this sooner than later. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces here. Um, so the RFP would, would uh, be dispatched um, under the current writing. Offers would be submitted until July 23rd. They would be reviewed uh, and then it's a two pronged um, assessment center. Uh, a written examination uh, and candidates to continue to uh, the next portion would have to pass the, that portion of the test uh, and then they would sit with a paneled assessment team to go over different scenarios that would uh, tap into their, their basic knowledge, uh, their leadership capabilities uh, and, and other administrative type challenges. Uh, ultimately, a ranked list would be presented to me uh, to uh, make the appointment. Uh, subsequent to that, we would also be hiring a firefighter paramedic to replace the person who's hired as captain. So it's going to be a, a fundamental change to the structure of the department, but one that should good, uh, put us in good place as we move to the future. So if, if this is put into effect, you know, ASAP, uh, July 23rd, would you, is that the date you mentioned? It would be the that? opening of the bids. Uh, then you know, there, there's some lead time to, for the consultant to come in and build up everything. Mm -hmm. um, the written exam, to be fair, civil service gives 90 days right. after the reading list is mm -hmm. uh, produced until the written test. I think that would be fair. So we have some delay kind of built into the process, uh, but the goal would be to have this all wrapped up um, if everything goes well by October. Um, okay. Um, I was just looking July 23rd. Um, three month, because it, it says the fire captain's candidates will receive a minimum of three months notice of the written exam. So if we go into July 23rd, that kind of like, it could happen sooner than than October 23rd. Correct. You know. Yeah, kind of built in some time there for some issues to present. You know, and at worst, if we started January 1st, you know. With the captain? With the captain. That'd be fine. You know, bringing it in, mm -hmm. bringing someone on board at that time. Right. You know, I don't know. So this is going to be a, 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 I'm going to be here a few times. Right. Uh, because right. the budget currently, fiscal year 22 budget well, doesn't reflect this position. That's correct. That so was, um, but I was kind of beaten around the right. bush to get so to it. So the process would be if we could get the ball rolling with the creation of the RFP in order to secure the services of the uh, consultant, get the assessment center done, get the list of candidates built. By that time, we should be heading towards uh, the fall town meeting. Uh, we can shop in the pencil and come up with an accurate number of uh, whatever budgetary adjustments need to be made. Mm -hmm. And just so you know, our call volume on the EMS side uh, has decreased from 
last year, and I think that's uh, directly attributable to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We went for several months where we didn't get the volume of calls that we had. It has picked up considerably, and as far as revenue received, we should be right on track. It's where we were last year. Right. That was around that six hundred thousand dollar mark. A uh, little less than that, but yes. But you know, yeah. in general. Yeah. Right. So, gentlemen, any comments? We'll push this through. Or you want to have a, a week to read it? And go well, through it. More time to a couple of weeks to, until our next meeting. That'd be great. Yeah. And ask and questions. I would like to do that. You know, that's, I mean, draft. that's why I asked that, mm -hmm. that October, January yeah. thing, talk about the budget. A couple know, of weeks won't hurt. You sure. know, that sort of thing. And uh, make sure we've got everything right yeah. and right. We'll do the right way. Crosses yeah. the T's and dots his eyes very well, but yeah. you know, to have that dialogue and make sure that we're all on board would be great to have very that good. opportunity with the chief. So we'll bring this up at our next or I propose we bring it up at our next meeting and uh, yep. Great. make a vote on it Good. Very and keep it rolling because, you know, I for myself, I'm, I'm okay with this plan. Excellent. You know, the work yep. is in the contract, so, you know, get it rolling. Very good. We only have two years left, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. A lot to do. Lots a lot to, lot do. to do. Well, very good. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move to just move out of order because we have uh, a gentleman from the golf course, Mr. Isaac. Mr. Isaac, no, how you doing today? I'm doing fine. That's good, thank you. That's good. Uh, we're gonna put you up next in the agenda here to discuss uh, golf capital update and golf uh, wage and classification, if you'd like. How are you this evening? I'm fine, thank you. Good evening to everyone. Good evening. Um, uh, what do we have? We got um, so golf capital update. Yeah. I sent a note out to the board of selectmen. It's basically said that our revenue plan year to date is going to be significantly above the plan. Um, Golf, golf has has a resurgence and rounds are up over 20 percent around the country and it's not and we're feeling the same improvement so um, at our last meeting of May 27th the golf committee made a unanimous recommendation to use the excess funds available in FY 2021 to be al allocated to purchase cash purchase of critical replacement cap capital items. The com committee further recommends replacing the real grinder and the blade knife grinder and at least one triplex mowers. Um, the grinders are over 20 years old. Replacement parts are no longer available in the machines lack adequate safety features. Replacement costs is estimated to be $70,000 with a useful lifespan of about 20 years. The mower we're recommending is a critical, is critical to maintain the turf quality of the greens in the tee areas. The mower is used daily and will replace a 10-year-old high maintenance repair mower. Replacement cost for that mower is estimated to be $58,370. Now, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're definitely going to exceed our revenue plan and we'll be turning a significant sum of funds back that will go to free cash at the end of this fiscal year. And right now, we have it, our overall cost is being held roughly to what our plan was. So that leaves us with a, we have an unreserved fund of 100,000 for unanticipated funding. Mm -hmm. We're basically looking for approval to use that funding to make these capital purchases. Right now, I don't know exactly how much funding is available. We know that 100,000 won't be used 
is not required to deal with any reserve, any spending we have. Right. Well, this is how it's kind of explained to me that we'd be taking 100 grand out of the uh, reserve fund to purchase this uh, equipment, bringing it over to the uh, whatever line item is associated, r and equipment line item. Um, the real, these real grinders, so they're the sharpening machines for right. the reels that are used in the... It puts in into round, ground around, to mm -hmm. roundness, and then the blade grinders that sharpen the blades. Okay, and then, I, you know, I'm assuming this is an ongoing progress, uh, process cutting the grass and yes. the course, and, um, and the other piece of machinery is a triplex mower, so it probably okay. has three reels. Right. Okay. Used for cutting teas and greens. For the teas and greens. Yes, Mr. Gaspar. The, the only, I, I understand we t it talks about excess, a significant um, revenue excess from the from the budgeted year and the things of the like, which will automatically feed back into the golf surplus, right? It's not the, what they call free cash, but it's it's a surplus golf surplus account. Um, and they carry $100,000 in the reserve, right? Right. That we were able to make capital purchases out of for emergency uses and things of the like. And I believe the request is here, it looks like the request in total would be $128,370. So we're $28,370 short of the request that's mm -hmm. being presented tonight. Am I correct, Mike? That, that is correct. Um, well, Sam, Ed, when, when you, what you presented though, I think you showed, so yes, you need the 100, but you also showed um, what you had budgeted for the year, what you expected to spend, and then how much would be left over, right? So you, sh what you gave to me, you had no. thirty-three thousand yeah. left in expenses. That's how much is left over as of right now. So as of right now, and, and the bills still coming in. So we, I can't anticipate what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. We still have two articles already approved that has a, has about thirty-six thirty-six thousand in them. So as long as the, the excess funded funding that I show you, yep. we don't exceed that in the bills being presented in the next couple of weeks, we should be okay. Okay. So I'm just excess funding. This 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 the language is not making a lot of sense. So we have a hundred thousand dollars. He's talking about a couple of articles, past articles that they still have some available cash mm -hmm. left. Perhaps, right. Mr. Isaac, I don't want to speak for you, but perhaps in those two other articles, we'll pretend it's two, it might be three, it might be one, whatever. Yeah. In their other articles that we've approved and town meetings approved is this extra money left inside of those funds. And he's looking for the hundredth for the board of selectmen to vote to release the hundred thousand out of the current year budget, the reserve, right? To make this capital purchase and then take the 28,370 from previous articles because you can't take it from the previous budget that's going to roll right. into surplus right. which needs to be certified in that through the DOR and all that you can't we just because we say we have extra revenue we haven't even closed out the year yet right mm -hmm. Correct. so you can't take and spend that money until it's been through the DOR and certified and that was, should go into surplus is that correct that's correct no, so what I was saying is he gave he gave a list of his current year salaries and expenses too that also showed a So surplus you'll have in floating it. money in the budget from other line items yeah. that should cover the twenty eight might might not I see know. that's what you're talking about, Ed, is right, that you right. you can't yeah. speak right. for that right. those line items yet. So if need be for the for you to get these two pieces, the three pieces of right. equipment, you need twenty eight thousand more bucks, right? Yeah. Correct. So you're saying either I'll get it from the remaining balances in my line items from the budget when we close, before we close out the year, I'll expend that to make this purchase right. once we know better what our bills are for year end, because we're almost at year end. If not, I'll take it from the articles that were previously approved to capitalize that 28000 yeah. We yeah. can do that. There's 36,000 okay. left in those two. That's fine, those two as long as we know yeah. that we're carrying enough money to accomplish the goal of the committee. Um, just want to make sure yep. that the numbers are moving okay, and we are going to be spending for the first time the hundred thousand dollars in the budget. Mm -hmm. But because the golf course has done so well, it appears that will be in excess of a few hundred thousand bucks this year, right? A revenue? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Right. So, so that'll yeah. that'll 
that's going to replace the hundred. That, that'll go back to the reserve fund. It's going to go back to the reserve, reserve fund. So it's we're really whatever you what, if you make four hundred this month, year yeah. and you spend the hundred out of the reserve, you really ended up with three hundred, but you got uh, new equipment. It makes right. perfect sense. Right. I'm fine with it. Yeah. And the real machines, I heard, uh, not OSHA approved, so we need to come up to compliance. <laughs> Oh, you want that? Okay. I don't want anybody chopping fingers <laughs> off and grinding fingers off, right? That's right. So, so. The, the problem is that the equipment's getting very tight. Ordering, ordering, ordering equipment mm -hmm. is is long lead times right now. So, mm -hmm. I have no idea. Right. We we like to make a commitment now to purchase this equipment. Right. Assuming Julie's review says we've got the funding, it is approved and is not an issue. Okay. So, Ms. Hebert, I think Mr. Isaac needs a motion from the board to approve, motion to approve the $100,000 in their budget from the reserve. A transfer, yes. A transfer from their reserve for unforeseen expenditures to their It's property. expending the money. The money's there to expend, so That's right. they, they can do whatever they want with that $100,000 as long as the board approves it, the committee approves yes. it. Yes. Right? Technically, you have to transfer it to a line item, though. Okay, so you have the line item. Do we need uh, yeah, to do all of that would... like for a specific yep. line item so yep. we can make sure that Mr. Isaac and we can get that because Mr. Yeah. Isaac just alluded. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. We, we had talked about this previous. RNM, you don't have a capital equipment line item that I saw anymore. It was zero, no. Well, right. There's a number. So yeah. if. Right, so if we put it in the RNM equipment line item, uh, number 524100. Is 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 that all? Is, will that be sufficient yep. for the DOR? Yeah. So he doesn't make a purchase, and it's in an R and M equipment, and yep. it's not necessarily a repair and maintenance. It's a purchase of a new capital piece. Mm -hmm. It'll be okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure that he's all set right. because Mr. Isaac, yep. he he just he's speaking factual when he says. What he's talking about is supply chains have been all disrupted because of COVID-19. I deal with this pretty much every day, supply yeah. chains. And, and it's impacted everything, whether it be a toothbrush or the lawnmower equipment that he's looking for, or lumber prices and things of the like. That's what's, what's causing the spike in inflation, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's difficult to get anything. You could put something on it today. And look, at, look at, for instance, the animal control officer's pickup truck. We've been waiting a year for that, and we mm -hmm. still don't have it in yet, right? So that's yes. why Mr. Isaacs, requesting what he's doing now is to get the ball moving at least get the purchase order so if one comes available they they can get it so in, you get the motion mr chairman whatever you're yep. going to need to expend the hundred thousand and give them the line item mm -hmm. so do i have a motion to transfer one hundred thousand dollars to line item five two four one zero zero iron m equipment so moved second all in favor aye, aye. And Julie will be able to sign a purchase order mm -hmm. or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, if I can just take one moment while Ed's here. Yes, and please. First of all, really good to see you. It's been a while. Um, I just want to thank you for all you've done for this golf course over the years, from the vision to have the thing built and the oversight that you've provided over the years. Um, I know you're a team player and you're part of a team, but you're a real unsung hero for this town what you've done for this golf course. I just want to thank you for everything you've done. It's nice to see that golf is back. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I, um, I couldn't agree with Mr. Wona anymore. At least for one year. <laughs> Mr. Isaac, you've been a phenomenal individual from the town of Akushna when it comes to this golf course, so thank you very much. I, I, I commend Mr. Wona for making that um, statement, and I'll, I'll second that statement all day long. Next, uh, concerning the golf, we have the golf wager classification. And um, I guess this just pertains to four employees. And Julie, I might need a little help on yeah. this one, if you can give me a little. Yeah, board, so little they had presented, back, yeah, back when we did the budget, they had presented um, a change in the wager class, and we looked at it. We didn't really have time to vote on an actual grade and step for the employees. We accepted the budget as it was just to get the budget along. Mm -hmm. um, and then the town um, voted to go with the one and a half percent increase. So just some of the numbers that were that were voted as part of their budget differ from what we have in the in the plan. So um, we're looking to try to make it all match up. So um, try to highlight for you guys if you have it their wage and class summary that shows the golf professional at uh, grade seven 
the assistant superintendent at a grade 10, the director of golf at a grade 11, and the course superintendent at a grade 14. Um, and then if you look, I, I have a copy of the budget that kind of, I mean, when you make a copy, some of the colors kind of look the same, but um, try to show you where each of those are in the budget, what was voted for a budget, and then also show you our pay plan for FY22 um, and where they line up with like a grade and stuff that matches what they had for um, a budget for, for town meeting. The only ones that are kind of in between steps are um, the director of golf and the course superintendent. So those are kind of, you know, between two steps. Jill, Mr. Mr. Look, I, I know we've, uh, you know, empowered the golf committee to really do a lot of oversight, but I got to be honest with you, I'm, I take, I, and I like to dive into it a little bit more, um, with the director of golf, I mean, I'm just looking at this ranking and the scores and some of this, I'd like to really get a better sense of, of how these numbers were derived at, um, and this isn't to pit one against the other, mm -hmm. but I would look at the, the, the importance of the course superintendent is obviously if you if you don't have grass, you know, if you don't have a you don't have a turf, or you, you don't have a golf course. But by the same token, the director of golf is such a critical critical position to the overall um, you know oversight of the golf course and you know pushing product and, and things of that nature. Um, I don't know. It just seems to be a little bit out of balance, and um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. And uh, I just I, I put a high value on that position because um, I've seen what it was when you didn't have somebody who knew what they were doing and when you do have somebody who does know what they're doing um, you know we're talking about how numbers are up and you know food beverages doing well and things of that nature I just think that that's something that needs to uh, an hmm. additional look and I, how do I present that without meddling or getting into where you all are you know Mr. Gaspar I, I would prefer more time to look at the whole thing as far as this goes. I, I Again, Mr. Chairman, no disrespect, we, it was Father's Day, it was tough. We, we got to meet the meeting stuff, some of it was in an email, oh, yeah. PDF attachment, some of it ended up on the desk for Thursday night because Friday was a holiday for town employees. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different things in here that, that take a lot of time to, uh, to look through, but um, I'm, I'm happy to sit through it. And, Look at different things and figure out where we've been and speak to the golf committee um, members. No, I just have one comment or question. Um, the salary, even with the increases, that was approved at town meeting. I mean, we budgeted this money for these increases. We budgeted yeah. this, yes. So Already, right? Because I see FY twenty twenty town meeting vote. Mm -hmm. So we increased. We, you know, we approved these salaries as they're presented to me right now. At the meeting. Okay. All right. Good. Well, then let's um, we'll table it till the next meeting and make a decision at that time. Is that good, good for everyone here? Yeah. Works Excellent. Me. Well, very good. Well, I think that uh, that wraps it up for the golf very this good. time. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Isaac. Have a good evening now. We've done it all night. This is done it all night, right? You mind We're going to take things out of order a little bit. And uh, <laughs> Kathy, we can uh, get you out of here sooner than later. Thank you very much. That's very nice of you. Very good. So I'm here to talk about, um, as you all saw, probably the New Bedford increased the water and sewer rates for FY22. Um, the water rate from New Bedford is going to go to four dollars and ten cents, and sewer the wastewater will go to five fifty two which is a 2.5% increase over last year. With that being said, I did an analysis. I hope you all have the analysis. Okay, let me um, catch up a second. Yep, thank you. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go through water first, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I take, I've been doing the same thing um, for the past three years since we moved to a tier rate I, I look at what I can, I come up with what is the best estimated income for billing for FY22, and I base that this time on a five-year average, and sometimes I usually do that on three, 
but with COVID last year, with the pandemic, the usage was so high that I didn't feel comfortable assuming that our, our usage would be that high again that everybody's going back to work and school, hopefully, permanently for next, forever. So the estimated billing in the FY budget, and the only thing I changed on the FY22 budget was I took out the $60,000 reserve, because I'm going to assume we're not going to use that, as we haven't in the past. So if we have no rate increase from us, the town of Akushnet, we will only increase our surplus of approximately $20,000. I don't feel comfortable with that, so I gave all of you some information on if we increase it by 15% each tier rate, so it would go to 615, 665, and 715, which would be a 2.5% increase from our rates as they currently are. That would give you a bottom line increase of 50, approximately $56,000. The other thing I said was if you didn't feel comfortable with that, we did a 25% rate increase on each tier to 625, 675, and 725. That would give you an $80,000 increase in surplus. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, New Bedford, in the, this past year, has in, have, have changed out all of their water meters. So I'm still getting numbers because what happened was their water meters were working, they weren't working, so our, I don't know if the numbers that they were charging us were a little low, a little high, so until we get more information over the next six months and I get a good usage, I'll feel much better with knowing when to bed for probably bill us. Because in the past, we've always had a little extra in the budget. And I assume we will next year, right. so I assume right. the surplus will be a little bit higher than this. This is if we spend every penny, penny in our budget, which I hope we don't. Um, yeah. What's the what was well we haven't closed out the year yet so we don't know what we built for surplus this year in water correct we do not know so I did give you analysis for the past I have it up through FY yeah 20. but this doesn't so selectman gas but the only thing is is on on the water surplus where I showed you forty three thousand nine forty four which was the increase in surplus from FY nineteen to FY twenty. That actually would have been 103,000, but we took 60,000 out to buy a truck. So that that's pretty good. That was a good surplus year. Mm -hmm. It doesn't show it in this number, but if you think about what we took out of the reserve, and what makes me a little concerned is we did decide to go ahead and take some money out of the surplus to do the uh, Nye Avenue water main. So we, when that's going to show up in FY 21. So at the end of the year when Big Town Accountant gives me these numbers, I know we're not gonna, we're gonna have a negative surplus because we took out money for that and we also took out money for the risk and resiliency evaluations that I'm working on. Yeah, but you can't have, you, you, you think it's time to calculate things a little bit differently than what we did because we used to take it from surplus through a Warren article, right, which we still do, mm -hmm. but we're extracting it from that current year surplus account, so it's dangerous. You can't really do that, and I'll tell you why. If you take two on the articles that we talked about, the truck or whatever it was, we purchased a water truck or whatever it was, and, and the, the resilience plan of 75000 65000 bucks. If if you do that calculation and you say, well, I'm going to do it that way, if you don't build that surplus, you, have a, you can't close the account with a negative number. You can't have a negative number in an enterprise fund, right? Well, no, no, I, I guess I didn't make myself that. We won't have a negative number. I'm just saying that, like, if you looked at from FY17 to 16 on sewer, we actually had a decrease in our surplus. So, yeah, we're not going to have a, our budget's not going to be negative, obviously. But no, our I surplus, am. instead of adding to our surplus, we're going to take away from our surplus. No, That's I am saying. I, so I'm I, saying in FY21, we will definitely have a negative amount. We will not have $1.1 million that's going to go down. No, I know, but it's not. It's, you're saying a negative amount, but it's not a negative amount. It's a negative amount versus what you purchased versus what your surplus is. Is that the negative amount that you're talking about, the two balancing? Because you, we didn't spend, we have a million dollars, 1.123 million bucks. Correct. So I'm saying in FY21, I don't. I expect that 1.1 million will be lower. Well, of course it's going to be because we have articles right. for expenditures. I'm, I'm sorry. So I'm not surplus. I apologize. I'm not the surplus. It well, the surplus. Of course, the surplus is going to come down as you make expenditures, especially right. if you're going to be doing water infrastructure. Right. And I talked a little bit about that five-year plan, two hundred thousand. Right. But we're we're generating. So, well, before you increase rate, especially with water, 
it's making it sound like we have a negative number and we won't have a negative number because in, in previous years we've been generating a hundred thousand plus in surplus so right. if you're generating a hundred thousand dollars plus in surplus in water why would I increase rate when you're still at a very reasonable surplus rate going forward because going forward I expect you're only going to add twenty thousand dollars next year and that does not include articles or any spending that is just our budget to what we will build, build out and that's not 20,000 is not a lot and also you guys you did not increase your rates in FY21 just to let you know so we actually skipped one year in water we actually skipped many years in water we've skipped a lot of years in yeah. water like which is which is great up. and I, I personally would rather come up here and say please don't increase rates I think we can but I, I don't feel that way this year but it's not my decision that is your decision I'm presenting this information just if you decide not to increase your rates your surplus will be approximately $20,000 do you know like just what's the average bill? What's the average bill? Like the yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying like So if it's um a lot of the um I, I say the people that have two families or the older community, it's about eighty dollars every quarter um to minimum bill on water. And that's and this that's would not make this is only fifteen cents, so on a five hundred dollar bill, that's only a dollar. And the the, the most people are in the first tier. Is that what that's first page? Two thirds. Well, roughly two thirds of the audience our water uses is is in the zero to fifteen hundred. If that's zero still fifteen hundred, it's actually yeah. based on the past couple of years. Fifty five percent of our uses fall in that first tier. So Ten percent in the second, thirty five percent in the top tier. More people using more water right. now. Right. And the top tier is a lot of our businesses, obviously. The other thing to consider is, um, as you're building the surplus, which I think is great, you know, we're going forward with changing out the water mains, which is uh, something we definitely should be doing. If you do not keep increasing the rates every here and there, how are you going to replace the water mains? How are we going to what? Replace the water mains. You gotta, if you want to continue on. Oh, no, I understand that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what the million dollars is for, right? And you do have to build a surplus. I didn't. I'll be honest with you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't think that we were at this at this level, and we don't really know what level. We're assuming twenty thousand. Is that what you're assuming? Is a twenty thousand dollars surplus based on the numbers that you based have? Based on so the far? numbers, and I think it will obviously be higher. I'm more conservative, as you know. You've worked with me many, many years. I'm a conservative person. I think it will be a little bit higher, but you're talking twenty to fifty thousand adding, not a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't really get into looking at the budget, Mr. Chairman, versus what the numbers are here, and I, I guess I would need to digest those numbers a little bit more on what's going on, because if I generated, if we generated, you know, $100,000, not this year, but the previous year, well, I think it was more than that in surplus. Do you have that number, Ms. Hebert, what we generated in surplus the year before 2020? Like how much you you gained in surplus for yeah. the water? so year over year. It's usually about 100000 in FY20, it was 43944 In FY19, it was 70996 Yeah, but see, that's the, see, you're using it as the, but I think it's because of the way they're giving you surplus numbers now, because they're taking off what you're doing in articles instead of taking it from the previous surplus. Say you have a million dollars and you spend 200, you just take the 200,000 off and you have 800,000, and then you, your year run closes out. If you generate $100,000, you push that into surplus, and it puts you back to 900. I think this is magic math trick going on on how things are being done with surplus and I mean I, I don't it's, it's the undesignated balance is is the surplus it's, it's undesignated so you're right if you're designating some of your money for articles it's going to reduce that fund balance the fund balance but not the close not the surplus generated from the year so you like get you a real look at like a profit loss and that would be a different number if that's what you're talking about, but if you're if you're looking at your surplus account, it's it's technically the undesignated fund balance of the water. So if you if you designate money at town meeting, it's going to come down. It's going to reduce that number. The, the surplus number on this side, not what you're generating the previous mm -hmm. year. You can't you can't you can't project a negative number, and you can't have a negative. You, and there's no way we went from creating $110,000 the previous year to only generate $20,000 this year. My question is, where's that $80,000 gone? That's why I need to, I need to look at the yeah. budget, reference all of that stuff, so I just, I'd just like more time to do it, um, or I can just not vote rate increase, though. So. 
No, but I need I need to look and digest numbers a little bit. Mr. Wong, do you have any comments? No, I mean, if Mr. Gasper needs some more time, I'm fine with that, but I just think intuitively in past history when, not that I'm for rating cases, but as things, you know, you see what we're getting from the city of New Bedford, if we don't keep up with that pace, we're gonna be back to where we were in 2010, 2011, where people get sticker shock. Mm. And then we get a huge problem. So well, we made we yeah. made a good we made a good adjustment when we took over the board of yeah, uh, public works, and I'm just concerned about where, how the numbers are being shown. I think I need to talk to the town accountant and Miss Silver about that and trying to figure out where. The I don't want to be true or happy when it comes to to right. to rate. Believe me, but by the same token, I want to learn from past mistakes in the town. Mm -hmm. You know, not keeping up with where we need to be. Right. So. Um, um, real quick, I know you want to take time, but on the sewer, if you do look at it, I am asking for no increase in the sewer. And that is because the sewer. Based on, like I said, the five-year average, and based on our budget for next year, I'm assuming we will have about an $80,000 increase in our surplus in the sewer. Which I'm comfortable with, and we have beat up our sewer users over the past few years. That's, that catches me by surprise. It's counterintuitive than what I thought would actually happen. We were always really, really good with water. And then I figured we were on the brink with the sewer because our last time we talked, we only generated like 35,000 bucks in surplus. And now are we generating 80,000 bucks when sewer has? So, so last just, year in sewer, we increased uh, our surplus by $56,000 last year. But we did, a, we did an 11% increase in the rate in 2020. Mm-hmm. That's, I remember right. I've done That's why it went up. It went from 14000 up yeah. to 56000 mm -hmm. And um, next year, based on what I'm seeing with New Bedford billing and our budgeting, I think we can do 80000 yeah, New Bedford's New Bedford. It was, when it comes to sewer, we're tied to New Bedford. They can't change that rate, so they can only go up very incrementally. Mm -hmm. And the rest is on us as far as the budget sewer budget goes, and that's where we need to get a handle on things because that's really what's determining the high sewer rate in a cushion versus the sewer rate that's coming from New Bedford. If you look at our sewer rate from New Bedford, it's it's minuscule compared to what we're charging. I mean, five forty-four, five fifty-two is the sewer mm -hmm. rate, and we're double on the lowest rate. Mm -hmm. And there's not much going on in sewer, so we, 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 we should be taking a look at that as well um, and seeing what's what's happening within the budget that's reflecting a 100% increase from the rate from the city of New Bedford to our residents. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. why I'm hesitant yeah. to, to stop pulling triggers on, especially, I figured with that sewer, water. I mean, water's still relatively cheap. i just like to take a better look at the numbers. When do you need the vote? I, would, I thought you wanted to put it in by July 1st. That when, was when, do you need now. To, when do you need to know for, for billing purposes? Because that's really what it I, For billing purposes, you this would take effect July 1st. And I do not bill um, the next one would be July 1st or September 30th. So I would not need an answer until September, September 30th. Right. But well, we have time is what I'm saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. Motion to uh, figure this out. not take any action tonight. And Kathy, I apologize Second. to you because I always do sit with you and go through the prior. All in favor, aye. I, I'm sorry. I was just apologizing to Ms. Silva because normally we do we always do sit down, but I know when I spoke to Dean last week he was out paving and stuff and he said that you were out taking up your vacation time, so I just kinda left. Yeah, I was uh, out for a couple of weeks. This is my first day. I, yeah. Oh, so see he was right. So that's why I was like, Well, I can't go and see you and discuss this stuff no, with you. We, didn't have time. we usually hash this stuff out amongst each other mm -hmm. and work yeah, through so the details. I'd be happy to sit down with you and maybe Melissa because I agree with you, I need to understand that spreadsheet that comes from the accounting department because yeah, it's just, things sense. have changed. It doesn't seem like it's changed for the right. It's right. it's a little bit screwy out with how that's being calculated. And I don't. I'm not, I don't yeah, know. maybe if we sit down, the three of us, we can understand. I think we need to. Okay. Thank you. Happy to do that. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Don't forget about oh. the trash contract. We got a waste management contract approval. Oh, Ms. Hebert has that. I already mm -hmm. okay. it on my end. It's just with the lawyers. Yep. What's right. changed? We voted this already, didn't we? Yeah. No, you yeah. voted CMAS, and you you voted you voted the bid. That's right. the waste management one, the bid. But we just put it. We had to put it into an actual contract. Okay. Motion to approve. Is is are you? Have you reviewed this document? I have read, reviewed the document. I am fine with it. Ms. Hebert reviewed it with the lawyers. Mm -hmm. Is this the one that went back and forth about carrying insurance or something? Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot of insurance stuff on this. And they, they said that we needed to carry insurance, but we were saying, or you were saying, that we weren't 
needed to carry insurance. So we've resolved all of that. That's what yes. this is, Ms. Silva? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this has all been resolved in this contract now. We're clean and we, we will carry insurance? Yeah, it's, it's more like who's, who's listed as an additional insured on the contract. So essentially, um, waste management is doing the hauling. So we, we didn't want to have to list people as additional insured on our policy where they were doing the work. So we're making them do it. That's and and then I know there was some confusion though because we do actually enter s the site. Is that the same thing that I'm we're talking about? Is you I think you said that we were going to need or you might you said that we were going to need it because we actually go into the facility or something like that to do our own drop offs. And that's, that's where was, the that was with CMAS. That was CMAS. Because oh, that was, we take our that's been resolved as well. That was done. Yes, you guys have signed so we're all set. CMAS is all set. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. All right, very good. And the cost hasn't changed. Right. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the insurance issue, Julie's all set, has been wiped out. Mm -hmm. I made a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank so, you. Chairman, Kathy, before you go, if you could just um, check with Dan. We've got a number of uh, requests for no parking signs on Slocum Street from the main street about halfway down. Maybe uh, you could check into that and see if we can address that. You want additional no parking signs? Uh, yeah, well, on, on we need we need we need no parking signs. Oh, there's no there's none there. There's none there. Yeah, none there. yeah. yeah okay. we talked about it at our last meeting when we transferred a license. Is that what we brought that yeah. up? And and it it is happening again. And I'm glad he's bringing that up because I passed by it and I'm like, I guess nobody's listening. But I guess we didn't put up the signs. But I know you've been on vacation. You're usually the one that makes sure things are getting done and not off the checklist yet. Call and make sure it's getting done. I will make so sure. we we were looking for uh, you know no pocket signs. Was it only the south side or was it? Yeah, it's, I guess we'll be the south side. Yeah. So you're talking on Slocum Street, right? From which JT's street down pub is? about halfway down. So like, there's a handicap. Okay. Sign right around there. Because the people are the, obviously bars are open now. So they're parking on the streets. And they're parking on that sidewalk where you don't really belong parking on right. sidewalks. But they're, they're so close to the corner, and that corner is already getting really bad and congested. Yeah, it is, and with those cars being there, it's just causing more havoc, and people okay. are crossing it. It's, it's bad. Quick, it's you not tell good. Mr. Minot, how many signs you wanted? Are we just looking for a couple? Probably you need at least two because if you put one 75 feet down the road, they're gonna say, "Oh, I didn't see that. I turned yes. around over here." So you're gonna need one 25 feet from the corner. Okay. Um, at least 20 to 25 feet, so they can't say they don't see the sign. Okay. If we have them in stock, I'll have them up this week, and if not, I'll make sure they're ordered. Right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Yeah, there's something temporary we can put up as well, just to show the residents there that we're. Uh, we can put that. We can put barricades up if we yeah. had to. So. Yeah. That'd be yeah. great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, you Kathy. Good, good evening. Okay. On the new business, we can go to FY22 appointments. Um, Gentlemen, if we could each read a page, uh, would be appreciated. And uh, we can go from there. I don't know if Mr. Wallman, you want to start? Sure. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, motion to uh, appoint Robert, Robert Gilmore, Richard Miranda of the Agricultural Commission. Do you want me to just go read all the names and then yep. we just do one big? Okay. Yep. Yep. Agricultural yeah. Commission, Robert Gilmore, Richard Miranda. ADA Coordinator James Merritt, Animal Control Inspector Rebecca Tomlinson, Animal Control Inspector Assistant Ann Easterbrook, Board of Appeals Mark Sinarizio, Board of Appeals Kara Westgate. That's one I'd like to hold. No disrespect to Ms. Westgate, we just want to make sure that uh, she's committed. Board of Appeals Alternate Amanda Baptiste, Board of Appeals Alternate Charles Leonard, Bylaw Review Committee Raymond LeBlanc, Bylaw Review Committee Kara Westgate pulled. Bylaw Review Committee John Howcroft, Bylaw Review Committee James Marritt, Bylaw Review Committee Dave DeRoche, Bylaw Review Committee Town Clerk Pamela Bonte, Community Preservation Committee Chad LeClaire, CPC Mark Sinarizio, CPC Amanda Baptiste, CPC Lisa Leonard, CONCOM Mark Broder, CONCOM Heidi Lynn Pelletier, CONCOM Everett Filla, CONCOM Richard Pimentel, Constable Joseph Latimer, COA Jerry Bergeron, Paulette Hudson, Maurice Sampson, Carol Simpkin, COA Director Heather Sylvia, Cultural Council Amanda Baptiste, Michelle Watts, Deputy Building Inspector Nathan Darling, Deputy Wire Inspector Frank Knox, Victor Pereira, Election Member Luis Benoit, Linda Blaze, Christine Brown, Donna Brown. 
And we'll just to appoint all of those with the exception of the whole. So moved. Mr. Oh. Mr. Chairman. Okay. I just got a question on the Conservation Commission. Um, Ryan Resendez is not on the list, but we, we appointed him at the same time. We appointed uh, another member. Pimento? Yeah, Richard. I think it was Richard Pimento. Ryan, Resend Ryan Resendez is not on the list. And we I appointed him at the same meeting. It's in the minutes that we did. Yeah. Richard Pimento. Is there a reason why Ryan but Resendez I, is not on the reappointment? I think he's under, he was taking over another position. Well, he doesn't want to be on Conservation Commission? No, he he does, but he's taking the over term. somebody else's term. It doesn't expire. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, these are the expired ones. Oh, I thought they all just expired at the same time. It looks like it's all three years, all 2024. Well, these particular members are, but that wasn't another one. Okay. Okay, fine. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yep, the continuance of election members. Adrian. Adrian. Allison. Andre. Uh, Corey. Allison Brunet. Oh, Andre Corey. I start with Andre Corey. Oh, because maybe you. All election members. Diane Kudo. Mm -hmm. Rosemary Dupont. Margaret Fernandes, Diane Ferreira, Carolyn Fortin, Riley Fortin, Russell Goyette, Carol Gravanis, Paulette Hudson, Kristen, yeah. uh, it's just a, uh, Kristen, I, think it's Kirsten, I can't pronounce her last name. Q? Key, I think Keo. it's Keo. Yeah. Keo. Beth Kalankovich, Lexi Labonte, Donna Labrode, Elizabeth Lever, Mary LeBeau, Carolyn Lemieux, Lauren Lemieux, June Lemnate, Lemrise, Ashley Leonard, Pauline Lincoln, Maria Moore, Margaret Mata, Francis Model, mm -hmm. Susan Perry, Faye Filler, Everett Filler Jr., Priscilla Santos, John Tavaz, Michelle Texera, Aline Todd, Joyce Wiley. All election members. Election member registrar Joseph Costa. Election member registrar Janine Susie. EMA director Gerald Bergeron. Energy committee Julie Hebert. Energy committee James Merritt. Energy committee David Wonau. Enforcement agent for the selectmen James Merritt. Finance committee Michael Boucher. Finance committee Susan Delgado. Finance committee Eric McGlynn. Finance committee Jacqueline Stan Stanley. Forest Warden, Kevin Gallagher, Golf and Operational Committee, John Avery Jr., Golf Management and Operational Committee, Robert Ferreira, Golf Operational Committee, David Flynn, Manuel Gula, and Ed Isaac, both of Golf Operation Committee. Um, Mr. Gaspar, I just have a different page. There's two people at the top that weren't mentioned, Allison Brunette. Rachel Charbonneau and then the election members. Do you know that on your page? No, I do not, sir. Do you I have do, those? I do, yeah. You do? Yeah. Uh, who are you looking for? Uh, right at the top. Election member Allison Brunette and election I member did, did Rachel David Charbonneau. Did already? So, yeah, David so did those on his, so on his yours page. Cha yours changed a little bit. Oh. I'm sorry. So there's something different on our pages, Mr. Chairman. So thank you for correction. Allison Brunette and Rachel Shawa. Excellent. Motion to approve. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's right. All right. And we'll move on. Herring Warden. Herring Warden. Uh, Scott, someone wrote over his last name. Her. 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 Perdigeo. Perdigeo. Uh, Historical Commission. Madeline Gavush. Gavush. Historical Commission. Dunstan Eric Whitlock. Inspector of Garages. Kevin Gallagher. Uh, there's a little question on this one. Insurance Advisory Committee retiree. Susan Picard. Uh, she's, she's still in Bristol County? Or I, have, 
I have not a town resident, not an employee. I don't know if that can happen. It's um, so for the IAC board, um, there has to be one retiree designated, and so she is a retiree for the town of Ocean. Okay. I right. thought I thought it was I thought that was the old police chief. Yeah, and I just blanked his name again. Pleasures. Uh, oh, Pleasures. Pleasures. Thank you. Pleasures. Yeah, um, he chose to um, forego it and Sue picked up on it on his behalf. Okay, so they don't have to be a resident and they don't have to be an employee. Okay, that's fine. Very good. Um, Moth Superintendent Inspector of Pest Control. Did, did you be giving your wallet to Mr. Menard? Yeah. The first inspection? <laughs> <laughs> uh, open Space Committee, Mark Cenerizio. Open Space Committee, Robert Rocha Jr. Parking Officer, Julie Hebert. Phase Two Stormwater Committee, Mark Cenerizio, Phase Two Stormwater Committee, James Merritt, Phase Two Stormwater Committee, Daniel Menard, Portable Sign Committee, James Merritt, Safety Committee, Joseph Correa, Kevin Gallagher, Julie Hebert, James Merritt, Daniel Menard, Christopher Richmond, Sealer of Weights and Measures, Theodore Machado, Shellfish Warden, Harbor Master, Robert Medeiros, Soil Conservation Board, David DeRoche, Kevin Gaspar Sr., David Wonen. Soil Removal Enforcement Officer, Pat Hannon. Special Police Officer for New Bedford Waterworks, Daniel Menard. Street Naming Committee, Kevin Gallagher, Christopher Richmond. Tax Title Custodian, Christine Mueller. Town Accountant, Melissa Ford. Town Treasurer Collector Assistant, Jasmine Benefito. Wait, uh, we got veterans agent, Ronald Cormier. I missed uh, town Jeff, accountant, assistant, Nicholas Monticello, uh, Weyer, Tilcon, Capaldi, PJ Keating, Nancy Franco, Claudio Moco, Jen Oliveira, Brian Ribeiro, and Jonathan Souza. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Tax title custodian is Catherine Mueller. I don't know if yours, you, I think you said Kristen. No. I don't know if your paperwork. Okay, tax title custodian, Catherine Mueller. And then Old Colony School Committee, I didn't. I don't know if you mentioned that. This no, should, you don't have to do that one. So you did it already, right? Maybe we change it after that. Because we already did that I the last you, time. We just made that. the appointments. And the reappointments at town meeting, right. so that was good enough. Yes, we don't have to do those okay, again. Well, okay, very good. Okay, I have a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. And the as far as the soil conservation board appointments go, that really can't be had until the AG votes the bylaw, right? Yeah, it's not it's not a official until the AG approves it, but okay. I think we're okay to. We're waiting for that to get passed on to the attorney general office or the town clerk's office. Yes. Okay. Minutes of the meeting. Town yep. meeting. Okay. Okay. Number four on the new business. Moving along, uh, social media policy. First reading. We've all been presented with a social media policy concerning the town of Krishna. Um, I haven't had a chance to review it in detail, but uh, there's any people who have, please go forward. Looks pretty comprehensive and straightforward to me. I mean, the thing is, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think this is this is fine. As long as you're not infringing on anybody's First Amendment rights and the constitutional rights, right? And it says right inside of it that you're not doing that. I've read through it um, thoroughly. I think it looks pretty good. I don't think there's anything that's outside of the scope of what should be recommended by employees really mm -hmm. when it comes to social media or anyway well if you gentlemen want to make a motion uh, I'll make a motion to approve second all in favor aye, aye. very good passes um, Touch upon FY22 goals and objectives. I don't know if we've already I received the paper. I like, gave uh, a number of different items listed. And uh, 
I think we can take a look at it and uh, decide how we want to proceed. I think there's a number of them that are very, you know, right off the top, we have multifamily special residential development bylaw. Mr. Mr. I don't have the piece of paper in here, but um, I, I think I've seen it in a PDF maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that in this here. But it doesn't matter. I, I you know, I just didn't know what was what's the deal with multifamily. I mean, who's 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 advocating multifamily? So, so you want to turn the town into a city? Or we well, talked about this when we were talking about townhomes, and I think we all agree that townhomes would be something that would be acceptable. But multifamilies, I think that we already allow two families, duplexes, and things of the like. But what is that? Well, the term I think is uh, was developed pretty much from uh, when we had that meeting with uh, the, the what was the developer over at uh, is it Rick Miller? Yeah. The name, his attorney. I believe he has Marky as an attorney. That they proposed there was a bylaw, a proposed bylaw change that was put up on the screen momentarily. That did say multifamily. It was again repeated by the um, uh, Mr. Davinian. Mr. Davinian as that way. Um, if it's the wrong terminology, you know, we can move forward. I would like to see what the proposed bylaw, you know, what they're proposing, I guess, as we move on. You you know, by, but we don't make bylaws for developers, do we? No, we don't. Well, they. We don't make well, bylaws for them. I mean, I think if we're setting goals and objectives, I think I think it's something that we we, we I think we're pretty much all in agreement with. It was the town hall concept of bylaws. Yeah, if I remember correctly, stuff like that. I'm still am, and I think we talked about 55 and all the things that we like. And with, that's with correct. Well, like, yeah, that seems pretty reasonable as well. Um, I think that's a good starting point for us as far as where we're at. The community is offering you know, 55 and older communities and townhomes and things of the like and see how you make out with that, but. Uh, I, mean, I think it's a little more targeted than just multifamily special residential development bylaw, right? I mean, I think we had a legitimate business owner in town who's got a property. Yeah, you know, I, I know, I just seen that, give, I was blown away by. Gives to gives, and to me, it's really a little more, the it's town a little more focused city. and targeted, right? And yeah. I think some of this stuff, might not materialize even for consideration until we get to the next stuff, which is the town planner, right? So some of the stuff I think we can park um, until we get the town planner on board and maybe we can have a planning session with That's that correct. person, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, second on the list, solar pilot programs, which have been yeah. touched upon in the past. It was the chairman, I offered that one up just again because it's something we just heard from Jim, we've got all these different um, de uh, solar developments coming into town, uh, solar proponents ask about it. I don't know what the direction the town wants to go into other than uh, we've got mechanisms mechanisms in place where we're not essentially relying on the money for our general fund. So uh, the solar pilots might be beneficial to us in some shape or form, especially if it requires, you know, if it allows us to uh, recoup more money than we would normally mm -hmm. um, so you know again I, I advance that just for to get our act together on that in that regard yeah I, I think that we did talk about that in the past solar pilot programs and I think there was some appetite to have somebody in mr. Blake I think was somebody who's been doing it town council was doing it and has been instrumental in other communities discussing that and how you would come up with the formulations and I think that we well, I know we absolutely talked about it because of the school roof Mm -hmm. is going to require an eighty four, eighty five thousand dollars funding mechanism for 15 years if we went ahead with that that plan that we had initiated five hundred thousand either from free cash or stabilization for our down payment where our responsibility was 1.3 million mm -hmm. right the 52 percent or whatever we were responsible for um, and we came up with that 15 year plan borrowing plan and that came out to like 83 84 thousand bucks um, and we're not really capturing that right now with the current revenue from, from there. So I think that, um, Mr. Warner's point, we, we absolutely had this, that discussion on solar pilots. So I would like to continue that discussion um, so that we do have a mechanism in place that we are capturing a certain amount of revenue um, every year. We're guaranteed that because usually the solar pilots go for 20 years. And if we're going to finance for 15 years, it would work right in that wheelhouse. So I'm all for that as well. And next on was uh, parking lot development, and this all kind of ties into the Slocum Street 
idea of redevelopment and putting some money down there with water and infrastructure redevelopment. Taking over that part of the town, not taking it over, but uh, <laughs> redeveloping that part of the town. Yeah, rehabbing. You know, rehabbing. We, you know, making you know. it almost a gateway to, uh, to Cushion from New Bedford. Over the bridge, up Slocum Street. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You know, we talked a little bit about the parking lot and purchasing mm -hmm. that, but I, you know, I think there's, you know, you need to spend money where it needs to be spent and, and you need to do what's already existing for infrastructure first. and. And, and look at that, but I think it's something that we could look at and have a discussion on it. But I think that you know, before you spend three, four hundred thousand dollars on something else, you need to you need to get your act together and right. well, rehab the road and infrastructure on the road before you start just you know ponying up money to other places. And right. Well, this all kind of rolls around. I feel it rolls around as Mr. Water said. Uh, you get the planner in and establish an idea and a direction, and, uh, and you go from there. See how it's all going to pan out. If the money's going to work, if it isn't going to work, or, or what we how we divide it all up, right. because we are still going to be get receiving some monies, right, Julie? From Kia, uh, from yeah, is that part of that I five billion dollars oh, that yeah. Baker has that he's going to be doling out to oh, the yeah. cities and towns mm -hmm. across the Commonwealth? So uh, we'll be getting our fair share of that money. So I'm sure, it's going to be fair. Well. <laughs> 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 so, so in other areas we touched upon for, for talking about uh, uh, outside dining opportunities, kind of tied into Sulcum Street area, downtown area, uh, mental health situation. Uh, yeah, you know, like, from the COVID. Right. What is what is that all about? Mental so, health. So, Mr. Chairman, the last meeting I broached the subject of you know there's a number of programs you know, around the country where public safety is is looking at how they respond to situa situations either at home or whatever, you know, in the home. Mm -hmm. And some really innovative programs that don't treat, that treat, it, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, incidences less as a crime but more as a health issue. And, it, you know, and, and they look at ways, you know, who they're actually sending to the response. Um, and I just feel like, you know, what we've gone through with the pandemic and, you know, uh, with that, are we equipped as a town to handle that? And, and, you know, is it something that's worth discussing to take a different look at things like that? And, you know, be the next logical extent, extension of how we treated COVID with the um, you know, testing and vaccinations. And this would be the, the final look at it. And it may be something that we can't even approach, but as a small town with dedicated fire and police, you know, EMS and police, it might be a, an opportunity to make an impact on people's lives, kind of like the chief did also with the opiate awareness and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, it just seemed to me like a, a, worth, a worthwhile discussion. Uh, moving on, we got the Lake Street uh, development. Speak, speaks for itself. That speaks for itself. You know, also Sevens tied into it with food trucks. I don't know if that's an idea that's being put on there or if it is, being and it's just like, do we need do we need a bylaw change there? Do we need to promote? You know, is it a, a common fix license or what, what, you know, if what can we do to promote that type of stuff? I think we have we we do common vic licenses, and that's for food trucks, isn't it? Technically, the common vic is more towards restaurant to sit down people. Right. We have a hawkers and peddlers. Which oh, that's the one that we don't technically. The, st the state gives that one out first, and then they would come back to us and just let the chief, the police chief, know that they got the license right. from the state. We don't technically because that's like an ice cream truck. Right. It, exactly. You know, the, they have to do that with the state. It's like sixty dollars. Yeah, or something. but the ice cream truck is constantly moving around. And it's not parked on yeah, a location. So, so maybe that's something would have helped. That's what we want to look at. Right? Something yeah. we need to. We need to. We should. We should definitely look mm -hmm. into it so that you don't get ten people in one location, right? right. As far as right. Yeah, right. I mean, this, this thing goes, there's an opportunity to promote it. Um, you know, in years past, we looked at, okay, do we turn over a town hall parking lot on a Saturday to a farmers market? There really wasn't an interest there, right? Mm -hmm. If we were to allow somebody who had a food truck, you know, business owner in town, would we do something like that? Would we allow it at Riverview Park? Would we allow it at? You know, yeah, Lake, uh, Street. Lake Street, yeah, whatever, yeah. right? Yeah, they got what? Back. There's actually it's just one now that um, sits out in um, the Freetown Post Office now yeah. in the parking lot. 
I taught him the other time in go in right. order or anything right. when I was out in Freetown and I stopped to do a mailing and I looked and I'm like, well, that's that's odd. You know, you got a lot of young people so, graduated from Old Colony, maybe it's an opportunity for somebody spots. from town, you know, to, to, to get into a business. Uh, I don't feel like we know how to handle it or even suggest mm -hmm. it, right? So. Well, and, then, and, and it's a good point because you may not want to have them, for instance, at Full Park because right. they already have. Yeah, uh, exactly. Right. Stand right. There so already. it's going to be a... Right. Uh, yeah. Pockets and pedal is licensed, but they'll have to do an application mm -hmm. for a certain location, and it's only good for that certain location, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And then this way there, you don't have multiple people trying to just cram in there and get, you know, cut throwing the other guy, right? I mean, a girl or whoever's doing it. Um, right, because like you look at at Fort Phoenix, they used to have the same thing. Like they would have two food trucks there because mm -hmm. um, they don't have a concession stand or anything. They were always busy. Like oh, I think one had does hot dogs. That's because it's a beach, and you have a thousand people on the <laughs> yeah, beach. You yeah. can't hot possibly make enough food in a food and truck. Then just one sold clam cakes or something. Right. Like something. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm always, I'm, I'm a big advocate of business people. So, if somebody wants to go out there and do something. I mean, make a few bucks and, and serve the residents of the Cushionet with some well, good quality of life food. Right. And, that's right. Have a nice day. That's right. Uh, social media opportunities. Well, tonight we passed the social media policy. And then yeah. we want to try to expand upon Facebook for the page. And, yeah. I mean, for the town. Facebook. For the yeah, we need to be careful of our social media presence. Like, it's one thing, like, the chief does in public safety and things of the like, but we, we don't need everyone getting involved with a social media page mm -hmm. from everything. I mean, I think you're, you're skating down a dangerous path when you have people that are able to respond to it because even though we have a social media policy where we can't, um, you know, degrade anybody and things of the like, we all know what happens on social media. Mm -hmm. And once those folks are gonna be able to, and you're gonna, and we don't need you, for instance, or anybody, in, in my opinion, dedicated to just sitting here staring at a computer screen monitoring a social media thing uh, yeah. you know like a, a, a group like all things a cushion it group where you're monitoring what people are saying what people are doing and responding they can go to their car drive here and ask a question or whatever I mean it's for certain announcements and things of the like yeah. that's yeah. different mm -hmm. but to sit and try to be doing this we're not we're not a social media company we're not no. Twitter or Facebook so let's get over the fact no, that public that safety it's got it's it's definitely got its ups um, fire chief and EMS and things of the like, and when police need to use it to look mm -hmm. into things and things of the like, but well, we're, we're, we don't need to get carried away with this. Oh, absolutely. We're um, working on updating the website. The website needed bad updates. I mean, there was a lot that wasn't happening on there, um, but I found that Facebook is a really good way to link people back to the website. So when we have it updated and we have all the information there, um, you know, throwing a post from the town of Dryden, oh, hey, check out, you know, even even the Selectman's agendas, you know, sharing that link to say, you know, the Selectman just posted an agenda, click here to see it. Um, a lot of people just use social media, they don't think to go to the website, but if they are, you know, friends with the town of Dighton, uh, the, uh, the town of Akushnet, or they like the page, it'll show up on the news feed and then they'll see it and be like, oh, wow, there's a, a meeting, let me look and see what's on there. So absolutely don't want to get into any kind of all things Akushnet. Um, you know, banters with people. That's not the point of it, but it's definitely to get information out there. And I think we have a lot of good things happening in town that I'd like to yeah, share. It's definitely great for communicating a yes. message, right? Mm -hmm. Information. Yeah. Information. Absolutely. Communicating it one way. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And you can, and you know, obviously you can control everything on Facebook, so you don't have to allow comments if you don't want to. Yeah, no, that's, we'll start that would slow just get with sharing information <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and go from there. But um, yeah, definitely hoping to reach more people and share a lot of the stuff that doing well a lot of these issues here that I see in front of me are goals of object not issues but goals and objection objectives and we got CARES Act money funding we're going to be as I just mentioned we're going to be receiving money how are we going to apply it to different things that that we you know we need mm -hmm. I was talking with the finance committee talking with us trying to you know maybe having a joint meeting uh, just to talk about how to mm -hmm. how to move the money around that sort of thing I got senior work off program. Um, you know, this has been a point I brought up early in my term here. Um, we have certain jobs, golf course. We just hired three or four people that uh, you know that we could utilize this program for instead of hiring people. COA, 
library, right off the top of my head, uh, three areas in town that we have. Uh, as as the direct, uh, not director, but the uh, appointed sort of bus uh, person here in town, I've been, uh, I'll make this announcement now as a preliminary announcement, but I've been working with Lynn Baruby over at Presidential Terrace and um, Heather Sylvia at the COA, and we're establishing, we should have it up and running by July or August, let me just say August, uh, for buses going to Walmart and I believe Walmart was on Wednesdays and um, Market Basket on Mondays for people who want to utilize it. It would be a small Serta bus and pick up it at uh, Presidential Terrace and uh, take the people accordingly to where they want to go. Um, we also have, Serta also uh, has a demand service here in town that people, if you go to the Serta website, uh, you can see how you can qualify for it, but you can get pretty much customized service. Pick you up at your home, take you to a doctor's appointment, or or there's other areas that they cover as long as it's along the route that they travel. About, I think it's like three miles outside the route they can travel to. Uh, so people can utilize that, and that would be something we'd put on Facebook and, and ways to get out Is there. Is that for seniors only? No, no, it's it's um, anyone you, like and if you, you got a doctor's you need a, appointment. You need a, I know people have done it with doctor's appointments. Mm -hmm. You need a doctor's certificate, oh. and um, I'm still putting together all the information. Oh, but right. when all we right. announce cool. yeah. when the presidential terrace is going to start, we're going to throw it all out there for people to know. Uh, we talked last week about Russell Memorial Library. You know, we'll see what direction that takes us in. Uh, we have a continuing quarry situation that we're, we're dealing with right now and uh, that will proceed at its own pace through either through the courts or through negotiations. Um, you know, I'm not going to expand on it too much right now but uh, one way or the other it's, it's going to go. Um, COVID, we have COVID, well that's hopefully that's wrapping up. We're all getting back to normal again or at least we're trying to and, um, and transition through that period of time. Uh, we got the union contracts that we're still negotiating over the next year. All three of them were up for grabs. Police, DPW, uh, asked me, and then yes, next year we're going to have to include fire. Talked about trash tonight. Sewer expansion. Uh, Mr. Gaspar, you know, uh, we talked about that previously. Mm. I, um, think, I think see. fire is up this year with police and DPW. I did a one year extension a while back mm -hmm. and then yeah, to do the merger of the two departments, but then we flipped the switch, and I think. Police and DPW expire at the end of this year. So Already, that, yeah. yeah at, at June 30th, um, AFSME and FIRE both have a contract that goes through the next year, so we'll be, we should be negotiating during the year. Yeah, we should try to do our mm -hmm. best to be ahead of the curve on we that issue. should be issue. ahead of the curve, so, yes. But, and can you just, you want to stop with that? I asked you a few weeks ago for the a real copy of the police department contract. Mm -hmm. So you mean where everything is merged together? A, a real police department contract, not an MOU merged. that I have to sit and paste and look at things and go, oh, what was the change, and then mm -hmm. flip and go, oh, this is the part that's out. Spent a lot of money with attorneys. They did. The police. 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 It's not been on our side. Yeah, police. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 no, it was uh, Roger. Would Roger no, no, was doing it? Yes, you guys we, so we have an MOA. We gave him a police. Oh, yeah. yeah. I guess we so have, we um, so we so we have uh, an MOA with them, but it, it has it has not been agreed to by the police to merge it into the full document. We've given it to them, and they've been holding on to it. Yeah, that's but we still have an active so. MOA. The MOA is it's a valid it's a valid. Of course, it's a signed document, so it's got to be merged into the contract and be mm -hmm. given to the town as a complete document. The town has done it and has given it to the police union. They have not returned it to us. So that's where it stands. Um, like mentioned, uh, sewer expansion, CWMP, phase one, phase two. We try to promote that. See how we can uh, push it along. I'm, I'm a proponent of expanding sewer in the town. I know it's going to be a, a huge task. And, uh, 
huge sale to the people that are going to have to hook into it. But uh, we should always continue that that discussion, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, it's really it, it's really up to the at this point it's up to the residents that are going to be impacted. Out of town meeting vote, we we the board of selectmen need to say. This is when we're going to do a meeting for all those 300 residents. We're just it's roughly 300 in each one of the phases, mm -hmm. and we're going to, if we're going to do phase one, you bring phase one into a room, you send notifications, you t you discuss it. It's a majority of the people there. If they vote for it, we do a sewer phase. If they don't, you, right. move, you move on. It's that simple. Yeah, because ultimately it does come down to the to the vote of the people. It's going to be, be affected on, by it. It's got to be voted on by the people. Mm -hmm. So. We'll figure that out. Hamlet Tree Bridge, Mr. Gaspar, you had mentioned. Yeah, back. fortunately, it was kicked. The can was kicked again uh, from the state to the Fed. So I mean, it's it's a work in progress thing right now. And mm -hmm. Kathy's back from vacation. I mentioned it a few weeks ago, a month ago, whatever it is. So she's mm -hmm. back. Um, I'll be getting into more discussions with her and her connections that she has with the folks that she's been discussing this with. But it's it's unfortunate. It's supposed to be done this year. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's supposed well, to be done 15 stopped. years ago, yeah, be well. the reality, right? But um, we finally got put on the list, which was a great thing for us. Um, and then it just kind of delays and, you know, the pandemic's the, the, the big new excuse for everybody, so. Yep, uh, development of the walking path along the Cushion River, that's um, all tied in with the development, the redevelopment of that area of town. It'd be great to get that a a bike path, walk a path down that river. It'd be really nice. We talked about it for a long time. Well, they talked about, planning board talked about a bypass road, which is you know, not going to happen, but a bike path, yep. walking path to connect us to Fade Haven would, would really be nice. And, uh, well, here we go. Meals tax before everyone yells out there in television ah, land. Ah, uh, ah. You know, it's something that we need to discuss. It's a source of revenue that it's not just, well, I can't even, I don't even want to get into it now, but it's, it's on the agenda to be discussed. Um, I know the last time we tried to bring it up, uh, the pitch didn't go over very well, so uh, but we're in a new year. Failed so, the town meeting. Yes, it did, overwhelmingly. So we'll leave that. Um, all right, so that just leaves us for new business. Uh, uh, we have a couple of contracts that we need to sign off on, and uh, I think that's it for this evening. So uh, new business, let me just uh, catch up to the six. Uh, the first contract we have is the um, so for the Board of Selectmen, and it's for the part-time administrative assistant, grants administrator. I know we've all read through it. Uh, do we have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, the planning contract that we have in front of us is being uh, directed to the planning board because of the town bylaw, planning board hires the planner. Mm -hmm. so I agree, Mr. Chairman. I, I would, um, I would uh, make a motion to uh, forward to the planning board for their vote. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It is under the purview of the planning board by the bylaws. And the golf, uh, we've tabled that for until the next meeting so we can review the uh, wage and class Correct. and uh, that the golf course is submitted to us. Right. So, um, other than that, uh, we only have information. I'd just like to take one minute. And once again, announce that we do have vacancies on boards and commissions in this town. The Agricultural Commission is, has one vacancy and two alternatives. Beautification Committee has ten vacancies. The board cool. of Appeals, <laughs> the Board of Appeals has one alternate vacancy. The Community Preservation Committee has two vacancies. The Cultural Council has two vacancies. Finance Committee has three vacancies three, on it. Three, and we actually have just received two letters of interest. There we go. Well, yeah, so just so, you, just so, you so there might just be one vacancy left on the yeah. finance <laughs> committee. And the historical committee has two vacancies. So if anybody is interested in, in, um, in working on these boards or commissions, um, please contact the selectman's office.
We didn't assume because we didn't hear back from anybody that we're automatically disqualifying them as an appointed member of the finance committee, did we? No. No. Okay. no. Nope. Because right. uh, Mr. McGlynn, he resigned, mm -hmm. and John Halcroft resigned, and we had one opening already. Yeah, John had to go because of the school committee. Right. right. I just so. want to make sure that mm -hmm. because we didn't hear back from somebody, because I know one of those members has been commuting back and forth from Florida to here, so things the communication line might be okay. broken. Mm -hmm. um, I can reach out to them, but you know, I didn't, I wasn't aware that they haven't responded, so I can reach out to that individual. Okay. And no, but we did pull anyone. Maybe she doesn't have any interest months. anymore, and that's fine. But I just don't want to disqualify somebody just because we haven't got a lot of interest because yeah, no, we've never we done that in the past either. Yeah. Okay. Well, very good. Right. Then, uh, really, anything? No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, future business selectmen's meeting, July twelfth, twenty twenty, at four p.m. Very, very okay. good. Okay. This sounds great. Uh, motion, motion, so to moved. Uh, so motion moved. to approve. Uh, motion, <laughs> motion, motion to, to adjourn. adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good evening, everybody.